I heartily endorse this event or product. Ahoy hoy everybody and welcome to Talking Simpsons, the podcast with the momentum of a runaway freight train. I'm your host, Average Joe Sixpack Bob Mackey, and this is our chronological exploration of The Simpsons, who is here with me today. Hey, it's Henry Gilbert, and I wouldn't mind having a third eye with you. And who do we have on the line? Brianna Gray. <laughs> In Virgil, Texas. <laughs> Virgil, I, I was just trying to think of a thing, <laughs> but I didn't realize you'd put me on the spot there. I thought you'd invent one for me. <laughs> we're from the we're from a podcast called Bad Faith. I guess that's that's the other important thing. And today's episode is two cars in every garage and three eyes on every fish. Please stay tuned for a paid political announcement brought to you by the friends of Montgomery Burns. Burns, change the channel. You change it. No, you change it. I changed it last week. Fine. Be a jerk. Then we'll just sit here and watch it. Today's episode aired on November 1st, 1990. And as always, Henry will tell us on what happened on this mythical day in real world history. <gasps> Oh boy, Bobby, the sometimes referenced but rarely watched film Jacob Ladder debuts in theaters, the classic Star Trek The Next Generation episode Reunion airs, and the 1990 midterm elections happened, and a young, independent Vermont mayor named Bernard something or other is elected (laughs) to the House of Representatives. Well, I don't see anything worth talking about today. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> really, this episode came out on election day. Yep. Yeah. It was, uh, oh. or, well, it was Thursday. It was not, it, right. it was, it, but it was during the week of it. Huh. I didn't realize that. I mean, I assumed that the, the staff had, you know, planned this like, hey, hey, fellow, we got to do a, we got to do an election day episode. Uh, yeah. I was so happy to see that it was the, like, not only the midterms, but the midterms where Bernie Sanders was elected to the House of Representatives. Like, that was, that was quite a surprise. Mm hmm. Yeah, and I'm over here getting caught up on which episode of Star Trek this is. This is when Worf meets his son. <laughs> yes, yes. It is It is the one where Worf meets Alexander. Uh, I thought it was Worf Jr. The kids call him Worf Jew. <laughs> the, most dis- <laughs> the most disappointing offspring in the history of the canon. Oh, he tries his best. He's a fail son to, for the He's millennial. He's a fail son. Yeah. I just like seeing little kids in Klingon makeup. It's very cute. <laughs> there is a, uh, you know, I'm sorry, sorry to cut that off, but I'm just, I'm still just still, still thinking about the fact that the Simpsons did an election day episode before they did a Super Bowl episode. Fox wasn't getting the elect, uh, the Super Bowl then. Well, also they. That's a good point. They well, were, they did have exclusive rights to the election though. <laughs> Well, it's, it's funny for the 92 election, they again aired on the week of ele- of the election because they're like, ah, but nobody's going to pay attention to this. Yeah, they aired the Itchy and Scratchy movie episode that That's night. Right. But uh, yes, do you guys remember where you were in this day in 1990? I was mm-hmm. on uh, midterm election day, 1990. <laughs> <laughs> Had you voted? <laughs> yeah, I vote. I vote in every election, often multiple times. <laughs> No, I guess I was a kindergartner in North Carolina. Uh, did you see Jacob Ladder in theater? I, I only know it as a reference to every fan theory. It's mm. just that everything's a Jacob's Ladder. I don't even know what that movie is. I'm I'm afraid. I'm sorry. Highly <laughs> influential movie in terms of video games, at least. Okay. It's a good... I only know of it as something that gets mansplained to me periodically <laughs> by, by, by movie buffs. Uh, but welcome uh, to our guest, big time guest this week for such a political episode. Yes, Virgil Texas and Brianna Joy Gray of the Bad Faith Podcast. Virgil's been with us quite a few times, but Brianna, you are new to the show. Welcome and thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be able to talk about something that doesn't directly impact the lives of millions of Americans for once. <laughs> so I'm sure you're excited to talk about a TV show that was a formative experience for a lot of people growing up. That's not Star Trek Next Generation. <laughs> it's true. Although I will say, as I watched this episode, I remembered that The Simpsons was considered spicy. And I mean, we weren't allowed to watch it. Mm-hmm. it we, you were one you of know, those kids. I was, you know, a kindergarten. I was a young kid when it was coming out. And I remember thinking it was completely unreasonable on the part of my mother until I listened to this episode <laughs> and Bart really is quite rude. <laughs> there's, there's so little Bart to be had, but I guess he is pretty rude. Every, in every appearance we see him in. <laughs> That's interesting. My parents had no compunctions about me watching the Simpsons, but once my mother told me to not watch duck man, oh. it was too lurid, which in retrospect it was, that is absolutely not a show for children, but I watched it anyway. And it just gave me this twisted view on the world. <laughs> 
Uh, so uh, secrets about Virgil, secret Duckman fan. Yeah, I'm learning so much. I want to ask a question for Brianna up front, though. Brianna, you are a Harvard graduate. I want to know why you decided to not write for The Simpsons because I assume <laughs> that's a job <laughs> offer when you graduate. <laughs> What's really funny, there was a guy in the class. I mean, there's always like a crew that goes on to, I think he was going to SNL. No, SNL is all the Yaleys. What, what, one of the comics. No, there's some Harvard guys. No, there's Harvard guys. Colin Harvard Jost. SNL? Okay. Was it Colin? Were you talking about Colin Jost? No, I did not go to college with Colin Jost. Um, <laughs> there was this guy, he wrote, he wrote, wrote for the Crimson and he wore a bow tie. I'm blocking his name now. It's not important. But he <laughs> famously got one of those gigs and everybody was really jealous and thought he was going to be the cat's meow. But. Not, none of us know who this person is or what their name is. So. Wait, you wrote, wrote for the Crimson, not the Lampoon? The, you So you didn't even go into the orbit of any Lampooners? No. One of my block, one of my um, roommates was actually the president of the Crimson. And so like that was more the orbit that I was pulled into. I remember going into a Lampoon party, I think probably my senior year. And the president at the time was, oh God, what's his name at the New Yorker's kid? <laughs> Oh my God. He just, he wrote a book like shortly after college about like ants or something. You guys are like, you're killing what? me here. Like, sorry. I'm sorry. sorry. Okay, okay, okay. I can do this. I can do this. I'm picturing like the Discovery Kids books about like different animals. Uh, anyway, the head of the Lampoon's he knew dad the, he was knew like, the a big queen. wig at the New Yorker. I can't think of the guy's name now. I can't think of anybody's name. I'm sorry. His name was, it was like Adam Adam Ant, Adam Ant, 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 right? Adam Ant, Adam Ant, Adam Ant. Whatever. But I remember being at a lampoon party, and I had never been to one before, and thinking, "Oh, this is actually kind of a cool vibe. I probably should have." Was it at this. the lampoon office? Yeah. The hmm. thing is, oh, okay. I did. I did editorial cartoons for the Crimson. And I remember only later in my, you know, college tenure did it occur to me that, oh, well, Brianna, you draw. Maybe you should have considered drawing for the Lampoon. But honestly, culturally, what was understood about the Lampoon and their brand of humor and who they were typically um, accepting into their ranks, it really didn't even occur to me that that would be uh, a place for me. But it arguably would have been a better product. <laughs> well, I, find that, I find that really interesting. <laughs> you had two tracks and you could have uh, written for the Crimson, which is like the main newspaper. And it's pretty prestigious. Or you could have written for the National Lampoon, and you chose the Crimson uh, in college. I actually, I also did cartoons. I did for the Humor magazine. Hmm. Did you? Really? And so I picked, yeah. So I picked the other track, and I feel like I made the right choice on that one. If you had <laughs> actually, if you had gotten on the Lampoon, who knows? You'd probably be the next Conan. You'd be hosting a, a late night show. Well, I didn't really do either track, to be honest. I was not the kind of college student who was very thoughtful about the decisions that were being made in college. I was just trying to keep my head down and get through it, to be honest, and was just hanging out. So it was only as I was like a junior and senior and reflecting back on the experience that I realized that there were options and choices and lectures I should have gone to and classes I should have taken. And I probably should have thought about what I wanted to do in my life. And that's how I ended up in law school. Hmm. Well, I'm happy my smart ass question led to this discussion. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Bree, how much Simpsons did you watch in your youth? Did you eventually, you know, uh, overcome your parents' rules on watching it? So we left the country in 1992 and didn't have the Simpsons. We didn't have it like on TV. My brother, one of his friends, uh, parents worked for the American embassy and used to get VHS tapes of stuff. And I think occasionally some Simpsons would come through. It was mostly episodes of Star Trek, but I really didn't, I think, catch up until I came back to the States in 2001. And then the fact that all of these shows just got put on like all the streaming services yeah. enabled me to catch up in the subsequent years. I love, I love this idea that you had to get content airdropped to you <laughs> in a foreign country. So this is what I just took for granted. Like, you know, oh, God, a box of cheers. Classic cheers. <laughs> I mean, not so much airdrop, but they used to get all kinds of things through the, the commissary. I know his friend always had Jiffy peanut butter. And my brother was always very jealous of that. I'm not sure what the allure mm was I mean, there were plenty of lovely local things to have that weren't peanut butter but yeah there was definitely a pipeline of vhs tapes that kept us in the know but what that also created was a dynamic where we put a weird emphasis on certain cultural products just because we happened to have them on like vhs or betamax mm -hmm. and not because they were actually very culturally important like a, you you made like a cargo cult for fraser <laughs> well, <laughs> we, we got ally mcbeal so we oh, were big wow. McBeal heads. <laughs> wow. um, we had junior on tape uh the classic arnold schwarzenegger joint and we watched that to death obviously we had come into america on betamax and we watched that to death it's a little on the nose i mean 
it, I'm <laughs> glad we had it because otherwise we would have been completely culturally deficient. And yeah, and, and lots and lots of Star Trek. I was going to say, I, we don't normally say what episode of Star Trek aired the week that we did Simpsons, but I wanted to <laughs> uh, to be welcoming in our, our history. <laughs> <laughs> well, I appreciate it. I feel at home. Picturing something like the, uh, I don't know, you ever see the Mr. Show skit, the, the underground video railroad? No shit. <laughs> <laughs> They'll watch it with you. Oh, man. The, well, I guess uh, the last like preamble one I wanted to ask Bree was, did Simpsons at all influence your you know, left wing politics or or uh, it sounds like it came a little later in your life? Yeah, it's funny. I don't this this episode felt very progressive in a way that I frankly don't really associate with the Simpsons. I don't associate it as not progressive. It's just a show, you know, and it made me reflect on the way that the show has potentially changed over time. I watched one of those YouTube, I was on a, a YouTube rabbit hole recently, and it was a clip talking about like why The Simpsons isn't funny anymore. And, mm. you know, they were <laughs> contrasting the kind of jokes and the structure of jokes that they used to do versus now and talking about how like all the contemporary jokes are the kind of jokes you would expect if there were a laugh track and the only really work yeah. if it's really mm. you know, telegraphing this is a funny point. Um, whereas old Simpsons had more artistry was the argument being made. Yes. And now I'm wondering if I go back and watch more early Simpsons episodes instead of whatever like hulu was funneling out to me on a given day or whatever i would have a different view of the show oh yeah but you don't have to like catch up after season 10 <laughs> mm. <laughs> this is an early episode it's the first one written for season two and it is actually written by i think the most mo for the most part written by one of the more right-wing writers on the staff john Swartzwalder. although i think a lot of it oh, is, is softened by sam simon the late sam simon mm -hmm. interesting i didn't realize this was a Swartzwalder joint wait you know, how right wing could this guy possibly be in a show well, pretty right wing <laughs> yeah not, you know, i mean he is not he was a famously reclusive man uh if we people have not heard from him in i don't know a decade uh, I, I on the commentaries, they lovingly refer to him as a libertarian crank. Like they're like, and he uh, wrote this episode, an episode about environmental wrote, pollution and and yeah, bribery. He, he and... wrote fifty seven episodes of the show. Well. Uh, yeah, Bob Bob mentioned, though, this is co-written with Sam Simon, who he was a pretty ah, left wing okay. environmentalist, uh, especially when it came to rights. animal rights. Yeah. Yeah. He he like literally gave millions of dollars to Greenpeace. Like that that's where his Simpsons residuals went. Also, like the extent of like at, in this period, it seems the extent of like Schwarzwelder's right wing views is kind of a pox on both their houses, you know, both liberals and yeah. conservatives full of shit. I, I also think with Schwarzwelder, they as a joke gave him episodes like this sometimes. It's and why? Like, day uh, the whacking day is the big one they yeah. gave him whacking day which is such an anti-animal abuse thing which he's <laughs> like not i don't think that's what swashfelder believes in but yeah well i mean it might be i mean you know there's libertarians who are very like pro animal like famously rush limbaugh did a thing with PETA. but i um, think all the old timey stuff comes from him the citizen kane parody and the in the yeah. opening of course with the uh, old timey reporter beat reporter and bart and lisa literally at the old fishing hole yeah that feels this, very swashfeldery this was the first to my knowledge i mean I, mean, I don't want to get ahead of ourselves here, but this was the first time to my knowledge that they like did like very specific Citizen Kane references. There's a bunch of them in this episode, but they, they did that uh, in many episodes. Oh, yeah. They're very on the nose down to specific parodies of scenes mm -hmm. in this episode. Yeah. Somebody made a cut once on uh, somewhere on YouTube. Uh, that's like all of the Simpson Citizen Kane parodies, uh, but in the order that they would appear in the film. And it's actually it's a coherent watch. Uh, it's interesting to think about this as the first one of season two, because they're not only are they using this as like a jumping off point of like, oh, they saw they saw three eyed fish as a one off joke in the first season. And they then wrote a whole episode around it. And then on top of that, after season one they're like we love mr burns let's write a mr <laughs> burns episode and also they're just showing off all artistically like in season one they do a somewhat brief full metal jacket parody right and i think that taught them like we could just do a whole film parody let's really go for it with citizen kane yeah yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, for as long as the show has been on, I kind of wish they had continued that meta narrative and like by season 30 done literally every scene in Citizen Kane, just Simpson five, every single scene dispersed on, you know, 100 or so episodes. Something must have been in the water. I was looking this up earlier today and Tiny Toon Adventures aired their Citizen Kane parody two weeks before this. <laughs> 
And I, I had no idea what this was as a kid. Wow. I think most Simpsons fans from our generation, when they then go to like their first film class in college and mm-hmm. see Citizen Kane, the light goes on. You're like, oh, my God, this is every reference. Now it's going to a Simpsons class. And you can it make sense of all the Simpsons references and other things. You guys are saying that. And, you know, I took film classes and I watched Citizen Kane and I honestly have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't I don't remember and I don't. Uh, I didn't catch him, so you're going to have to flag him for me as we go. We will zero in on them, definitely. It's not in this episode, but the one that finally unlocked it for me of like, as, as a kid, I'd seen the big ones they do in this. Like, I, I sort of knew like, oh, if a guy has a big picture of himself behind him, that's Citizen Kane. But in a later one in, of Simpsons, uh, Streetcar Named Marge, there's the bit of Homer tearing up the program and flipping it over and over, which is what the theater critic does when he's born in Citizen Kane. Mm-hmm. And I didn't mm-hmm. realize uh, until I saw Citizen Kane, that's when I was like, oh, Homer did that very specific motion because they they were referencing that. You know, I don't... The, uh, Streetcar Named Marge, I don't want to get too off track here, but Streetcar Named Marge <laughs> is one of those episodes that I watched as a kid and I just did not understand in the slightest. Did not get it all. But as an adult, I have a newfound appreciation of it. Hmm. I don't know what I thought of this one as a kid because, again, mm. very little Bart, very yes. little of the kids. It's all political stuff. Yeah, I mean, I to, to the, as far as season two episodes go, I liked it because, I mean, it is about Mr. Burns, who is like one of the more interesting characters on the show. And I, I, I also find it interesting that their first, like, this is really the first non Simpsons, you know, our favorite family uh, <laughs> episodes, right? Yeah. And it's, and it's interesting that they chose Burns for that one. It shows how fascinated the writers were with Mr. Burns when the rest of the world wanted more Bart. So their first <laughs> attempt at season two was let's do an entire Mr. Burns episode. The family is in it very little. Yeah. There's this kind of, you know, uh, it, the family almost feels like a B plot here that maybe in the in an earlier draft they wanted to explore this Marge Homer tension, but it doesn't it it takes a backseat to all the burn stuff, which in my mind, I don't know, maybe it's because I'm politically inclined, I find more interesting. And I also, I mean, always also love just Burns the voice acting. That's mm-hmm. funny because I I thought the fa- I mean the the part of the episode that resonated the most for me that I liked the best was the Marge Lisa dynamic and Marge telling Lisa mm-hmm. if there's anything that you can learn from this evening it's to give your mother some credit or give her the benefit of the doubt or something don't sell her short mm-hmm. and then it's Marge who you know can sometimes get overwhelmed by the force of the other characters like the strong the strength of the other characters who who hatches the plot that ultimately foils Mr. Burns' uh, gubernatorial aspirations. Well, this episode, I think they have to work overtime to get the family in there. They're like, okay, well, let's. we can't spend all day in Mr. Burns' office with all the people. Let's cut back. <laughs> what, to- if, what if Homer finds Mr. Burns and they have a scene together? Sure. <laughs> you know, it's interesting. You, you know, this, they, the Simpsons had an all-male writer's room. Some episodes were written by women, like notably the very first one, but, uh, you know, by and large, like the day-to-day, you know, yep. it was all men. Yeah, not until season six was there a woman in the writer's room. And at wow. points, you know, there's been trouble writing the central female characters of the show. And often they just have a, uh, they, they just become like kind of a one dimensional and just instrumental to the plot. Like, you know, Homer's going to do this crazy thing and Marge is going to nag him and that's going to create the kind of tension here. But this is one where, you know, it seems very deliberate that Marge is the smart, sensible one. Mm-hmm. That and even like so, and the clever yeah. one. Yeah. And even that being the case, she ultimately doesn't contradict or kind of challenge Homer outright, he says, your job is, you know, you can express yourself through your cooking and homemaking. And she says, <laughs> yeah. oh, yeah, okay. All right. No. Let me use this loophole. Uh, wait, who is it? The, who's the right? Was it Schwartzwelder who said, I just don't want to write Lisa in? Uh, it was in my, Mike Reese's book. He made it very clear that often Schwartzwelder scripts would have no lines for Lisa no. or Marge. <laughs> and, they'd have to have them and oh, yeah, also in, in these all that's all the male, libertarian coming out <laughs> in the all male writers room. It was punishment. The new people write the Marge episodes. Yes. Because yeah. no one else wanted to. Wow. Also, a fun bit of trivia to go back to the Harvard stuff. The one freelance woman who wrote this season in season two uh, is actually a crimson vet as well. Oh, yeah. Oh, well, what do you know? You know, that's, I mean, a lot of them were. I mean, uh, well, I guess Lampoon, you know, crimson, but yes, Harvard generally. Yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> I mean, that's a, that's a shame hearing that about the Marge episodes because, I mean, some of, I mean, Marge episodes have been some of the, some of the better ones. Oh, yeah. Yeah. The Simpsons will be right back. Oh, 
hope you realize that playing with guns is an obvious cover up for your male inadequacies. Yeah? Well, why would anyone play with dogs? Why would anyone play with you? 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 Why would anyone play with any of you? Burger King's got the Simpsons. Come in, enjoy either delicious new mini muffins or golden fries. And for an extra $3.99, bring a Simpsons doll home. Hurry in, they won't be in town long. With the momentum of a runaway freight train, it's the break for this week's podcast. A big, big, big thank you to our guests this week, the returning Virgil, Texas, and first-timer Brianna Joy Gray. What a pleasure to record with both of them about such a political episode. Uh, you listeners should definitely check out, if you haven't already, their podcast, Bad Faith, both wherever you find podcasts and on their own Patreon. Bad Faith Podcast with Brianna Joy Gray and Virgil, Texas. It's a lot of fun. And... If you enjoy our podcast, Talking Simpsons, thank you, because we can only do this thanks to the support of listeners like you who subscribe at patreon.com slash Talking Simpsons. This is me and Bob Mackey's full-time jobs, and it's only possible thanks to $5 and up subscribers at patreon.com slash Talking Simpsons. And for that support, they get to hear every episode of this podcast a week ahead of time and at free and they get tons of extras. Once a month, they get to hear our exclusive to Patreon Talking Futurama podcast. We're in season three of Futurama and you can only hear us talk about it there. And coming at the end of this month for three whole months straight, we're doing Talking of the Hill season two, part one, where we're covering King of the Hill's second season in the same in-depth style we do The Simpsons, one episode at a time, only for subscribers to patreon.com slash Talking Simpsons. And there's a gigantic back catalog of over 80 exclusive podcasts you can listen to if you sign up right now and you get all the new stuff. So please, five bucks a month at patreon.com slash Talking Simpsons. But you know, a deal even Charles Darwin couldn't say no to, our $10 a month premium level at patreon.com slash Talking Simpsons. All that $5 stuff I just mentioned is included, but at the $10 level, you also get our premium extra long once a month podcast, What a Cartoon Movie. See, each week, in addition to Talking Simpsons, we cover an animated series on our separate podcast, What a Cartoon. And if you're a Patreon subscriber for 10 bucks a month, you get to hear What a Cartoon Movie, where we cover an animated feature film as in-depth as we do The Simpsons often for over four hours, sometimes even five hours. Recent ones have included DuckTales the Movie, Treasure of the Lost Lamp, The End of Evangelion, Dexter's Lab, Ego Trip, and coming your way next month if you're a $10 subscriber, our discussion of the 20th anniversary of Shrek. We are going to have a ton of fun, and you can only hear the full thing over a 100-hour back catalog of What a Cartoon Movies if you're a $10 and up subscriber at patreon.com slash Talking Simpsons. So please, Consider signing up today. Okay, so this episode begins with a regular ass chalk gag, though I did want to bring up that when this episode re aired in June 1992, they changed it to a very new at the time joke, a rip from the headlines joke. It's potato, not potato with an oh. E at the end of it. So, oh, so we got a syndication change when I just mm. watched it on Disney Plus. It was it was like something more mundane. A little in season two or three, they finally start going like, "What? What, what if we change it for the for the news that's going on?" But, this one's about xeroxing his butt. Yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so yeah, the episode begins with a uh, a very ambitious opening shot of just this like long long uh tracking shot down to them at the swimming hole like that's not easy to do in animation and like yeah you compare this to homer's odyssey and how rough that one looked in season one this is a big change and uh, and i also like how you know anachronistic bard and lisa are at this episode yeah. at swimmin hall barefoot fishing with sticks <laughs> twine wrapped around it and uh, they get visited by dave shutton who is uh mod- his voice is modeled after the late actor mason adams mm. He Do very, your own work, Shutton. <laughs> <laughs> That's the thing. Shutton very rarely appears. Like if, if sometimes if they're at like a news thing, you'll see him in the background. After season five, it's very rare to see him. I think he was covering Bart having fallen down the well. 
in yeah, season three. Yeah. I remember him having mm-hmm. some speaking roles there. Yeah, he's. I remember the shot of him at his laptop with. Uh, oh yeah. As, as then he finds out that the uh, Abraham Lincoln squirrel has been shot, and he drives off. <laughs> Yeah, he's it. Shun seems uh, very uh, competent here. Like he's really going for the story, and uh, in later seasons, he's he's played as a dodo. I didn't realize uh, it was a recurring character. And when a reporter showed up out of the bushes talking to the children, I thought it was a little bit of a stranger danger moment we were in for. <laughs> well, that's your that's you looking at it from twenty twenty one. It is. <laughs> there are all these things we got to be on guard for. In, <laughs> in nineteen ninety, you know, it was a more peaceful time for America, and you know, you could just be a reporter and. You could just go up to children and ask them how's it going <laughs> uh, looking for a story i'm a freelance reporter too don't worry i but uh, i i looked it up his last key role in an episode was in season 14 mm. uh, you'll you'll find him as a cameo here and there but i think two shutton is relegated to that you look he looks too much like a season two guy and if you see him walking around yeah. in, in anything after 10 he looks weird his hair is blue yeah it's right they don't there do that anymore yeah. ah, i miss i miss that i miss i miss that animation style i don't like it when things get you know standardized to such a degree that it's all you know you lose those like weird little touches uh especially i noticed that when uh, uh burns meets his campaign staff and you get some very non-standard simpsons background oh, yeah. characters there uh with dave Shonen, he's not really that much of a background character but i mean i don't know i don't watch every episode of the show anymore so maybe he's moved in with the simpsons at this point you know that, I, had some hard I, times I, you know, print, print, print media died and you know our uh you know i was uh, doing a blog and then it was sued by hulk hogan and now <laughs> i or sued by rainier wolfcastle and now i got a move in with the simpsons before i get back on my uh, feet dave shutton's on medium now <laughs> not not big enough for Substack, but uh um, and then lisa's lisa teaches him how to make a podcast come on this is a great episode i i remember as a kid i really loved hearing bart like mouth off to him with like well this is my day and we do sir that was a fantasy of mine to mouth oh. off to an adult like that the show was a bad influence <laughs> yeah and that 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 line is precisely when I thought to myself, well, mom was right. <laughs> <laughs> Hell of a handbasket. Uh, I just love there was something for me as an eight year old watching it, hearing him go like, well, this is my day. And I'm like, yeah, this is my day. <laughs> Bart's right. But yes, we then get a joke of uh, them catching the fish and revealing the three eyes on him. And uh, really great how slowly he counts the three eyes and. <laughs> Uh, and so, yeah, this all the stuff about nuclear waste. It was very ripped from the headlines in 1990 when The hmm. Simpsons. That's I. It, it's why originally they made Homer a nuclear technician. Like uh, I, I mean, there were yeah. tons of you like in the United States, a lot of toxic dumping stories, and on top of that, yeah. you got Chernobyl too. Yeah, you got Chernobyl, you got Three Mile Island. Uh, yeah during the carter administration and there was uh you know i mean i guess that was like 10 years ago but you know the the anti-nuclear movement was pretty potent in the 1980s not just against nuclear weapons but against uh nuclear power and there was a lot of direct action around that uh and i uh, part of this is influenced by uh, the china syndrome yeah we forget that i mean homer is so associated with the nuclear power plant we forget that what is uh in season one the reveal of him working there was a joke yes <laughs> Yeah, right. Because it's this thing that was, you know, well, weird. People don't really understand the science behind it. It was also like broadly unpopular because of these, you know, big nuclear slip ups. Uh, I, I looked this up in 2010. There actually was a viral news story of a three eyed fish being found near a nuclear plant mm. in Cordoba, Argentina. And that's uh, not very cute. It's not as cute as Blinky. No, no. Stuff. It was not that's cute. Not it was weird. The nuclear power. Uh, correlation is not causation. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> there's no what liability did, here. <laughs> what did it taste like? Uh, you know, the, the, the Huff Post uh, article that stole it from wherever its original source was did not mention that, unfortunately. I would, I would have eaten it. Uh, I would have you, eaten it just for, because of the meme. I don't know. It was, you know, it was you know, to pay for being governor. It was 1990. I was learning most of my science through Ninja Turtles episodes, and this all checked out to me. <laughs> yeah. The idea of mutants was very interesting. Uh-huh. And uh, so, yes, Bart catches the fish, and it leads to a front page news story. Uh, which I love. Again, they're already into their own history at this point because Bart cuts out that news story and puts it in a scrapbook next to El Barto and the stealing of uh, of Springfield's head. And uh, I like the headlines too of like there's subhead of like count the eyes, Mister Burns. <laughs> and uh, sister was just there for the tranquility. I love that. 
Uh, but yes, we first hear of Mary Bailey here, the the still yeah. uh, canonical governor of the Simpson State. I just put it together because Mr. Burns was patterned after Mr. Potter from It's a Wonderful Life. And Mary Bailey is literally a character in It's a Wonderful Life. So yes. that can't be a coincidence that that's her name. Oh, interesting. Yeah. OK, I, know, I never made that connection. Is, is there a real life politician that Mary Bailey might be based on? You know, I was thinking Ann Richards. Yeah. 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 Well, was she was governor of Texas by then. Well, because she loses to W in 94, so she must have been uh, at least running in 90. I don't. Th- yeah, and she might have she might have been a two term. I don't remember. That's it was 91. Question. She was oh, governor of wow. Texas. But right, with her, with um, with Mary Bailey, there is no joke. She is not corrupt. She I guess the joke about her is she actually trusts the uh, the intellectual <laughs> capacity of the citizens. And mm-hmm. that's a mistake. <laughs> she's very honestly, you know, I, I, don't, I hate to say this, but she's very Elizabeth Warren vibes. Mm, hmm. I could see that. Yeah, I uh, in well, in general, she's just like boring. I think that's why she never came <laughs> well, yeah, back. She's competent. Like, she's not flashy, you know, <laughs> and very li- also just very well liked too. I I saw the mi- wonderful life reference as like a way of saying this is two vi- like he's Citizen Kane. This is like two mm. visions of 1940s politics battling each other. Yeah, I like to think that this is how uh, liberals viewed the. 2020 primaries <laughs> this, is, this is this is bernie versus warren or, or bernie versus hillary clinton you know because bernie's very mr burns like he's got all those houses <laughs> and who knows what kind of nuclear waste is you know he's got cooking up there similar haircuts yeah <laughs> yeah and he's, he's got all this pie in the sky promises and mary bailey's just you know we're gonna just have some some normal structural change the most anachronistic <laughs> part the most anachronistic part of this episode i felt was when the bribe was offered and wasn't taken the 2020 mm. version of this episode ends after about four minutes <laughs> <laughs> uh yeah the, the these these same inspectors show up in a later episode and are successfully bribed so mm. that the box uh, the box yeah <laughs> uh, uh, but, but yeah. I, I mean but just again like just i mean just the idea of mary bailey is just just a very interesting character because you know everyone in the simpsons world is stupid or corrupt Mm-hmm. And here is a politician that you're just supposed to think is unequivocally, you know, a decent person uh, and to boot a woman at a time when there were not very many women elected to governorships or Senate. Oh, yeah. Actually, here in our first clip, uh, this is where the politics come to the breakfast table and it's every every act starts with a scene at the breakfast table, hmm. the family talking about right. it. So. Well, leave it to good old Mary Bailey to finally step in and do something about that hideous genetic mutation. Mary Bailey. Well, if I was governor, I'd sure find better things to do with my time. Like what? Like getting Washington's birthday and Lincoln's birthday back as separate paid holidays. President's Day. What a ripoff. <laughs> I bust my butt day in and day out. You're late for work, huh? So someone will punch in for me. Try not right to steal a- anything, Dad. Keep those mutants coming, Homer. I'm muting you. <laughs> He's right about that. More holidays. More paid <laughs> holidays. We have very few in this country compared to other countries. You I hear would- the libertarianism. I'm hearing it now. The idea <laughs> that the worker is just lazy and just wants more time off and doesn't actually earn what they, you know, any, you know, their See, salary and... Mr. That's, Burns is kind of righteous and wanting to cut corners in some respects. That's 100 percent the duality of the show in these seasons, because at times they did episodes that were very pro worker. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The uh, uh, last exit to Springfield, for instance, and which, you know, uh, many people say that's the favorite episode in the entire series. And yet there's always this kind of satirical bite to it, which is. You know, we, you know, the workers that, you know, they they're organizing uh, for, you know, for 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 time off for health insurance and things like that. But, you know, they're also lazy slobs. But, you know, from my position, I don't see a contradiction there. I think it's great to be a lazy slob. I'm a lazy (laughs) slob and I, you know, give me, give me, give me. (laughs) <laughs> and that's and that's can... fine that's the, that's how it's supposed to work you know yeah i want more because th- why should the lazy slobs on top get more than i did de- i demand well, handouts in, in 1990 the lazy slob can support three children in a three-bedroom house a cat and a dog a car <laughs> that works most of the time <laughs> a cat and cars. A dog. <laughs> as yeah as a single income earner too like marge uh, does, uh she's not 
uh, working a job too. Yeah, it's well, I will say in later canon in Simpsons, his parents do help him buy a house. So mm. it's uh, yeah. it's it's not that he didn't just buy the house with his money. But yeah, yeah but but it's, uh, you know, it's not like his dad was very rich. I <laughs> He only had as to go back to the canon again. He only had that house because he uh, was on a crooked 50s game show. And he ran <laughs> it out on everybody else. <laughs> Um, but uh, but I, I really, you know, this version of Marge here, who's like very politically engaged, like reading the newspaper at the table. I don't think there's a version of Marge ever existed again. No, in the future, she'd be like, politics are none of my business. Yeah. And that would be that. But I, I do like this politically engaged Marge in this episode. The fact of Mary being this flat character who, you know, is not supposed to have any guile, who is supposed to, we're supposed to believe is honest and trustworthy. It almost seems like an extension of naivete. And that all of these women characters, including the mayor her, or the governor herself, are just supposed to be a stand in for how simple minded and na- naive and you know, basic, uh, a kind of gender belief in politics is. Yeah. It's a very deliberate choice. I think to make the governor female in this and mm-hmm. to uh, intimate that, well, because she's a female politician, uh, she, you know, she's not going to be corrupt and uh, she's not going to have any kind of personality other than being like a good organizer and an honest, uh, politician. Mm-hmm. Like you're not going to, she's, she's not like a mayor Quimby type. She's not going to be a, one of those corrupt Kennedys or, you know, like a sex maniac or something like that. <laughs> and I mean, I have to imagine, you know, that's a pretty deliberate choice because I honestly can't view this episode working the same way. If, the governor the good governor had been male yeah why else would marge be interested mm-hmm. <laughs> well, well That's another think, wrinkle too yeah i think too you know you see in uh sideshow bob roberts in season six you see what they do when they have two funny sides like it's the when the democrat and the republican are co- comedic figures that like that's why there's not a debate in this episode too i figure is because it's like well mary bailey's not funny she's yeah. just supposed to be the good politician who yeah. obviously should de- defeat burns which is again why i just I'm, I'm trying to rack my brain but i'm sorry my knowledge of female governors in the late 1980s early 1990s is a little lacking and i apologize for that i know you invite me on the show for a certain <laughs> purpose and i feel like i have not done my homework which is why i just keep wondering if there is a specific mm. you know uh, a politician she's modeled after and like nobody really comes to mm. mind like not even ann richards uh, I don't know, she made model after Diane Feinstein or something. I don't think Schwartzweller would have done that. No, I wouldn't know Schwartzweller. I, I mean, I don't know. So I could, I could see Sam Simon giving her a bunch of money over over the years. Yeah. I also the interesting thing with Bailey is that clearly after doing this commentary, Al Jean, the head writer on The Simpsons, realized like, oh. Mary Bailey exists because yeah. in a 2002 episode, she returns for a one-off thing. And this, uh, this commentary was record- recorded in 01. So that now the commentary is 20 years old. I feel, I feel very old. Uh, Eventually you're going to have to do a show about the Simpson commentary. Track. <laughs> we partially do with this podcast. <laughs> I, I do like that Homer is just very selfish with his vision for politics. Like he just only wants the thing for him. And that I, I believe it was uh, from looking it up, it was like 71 when it officially became President's Day and not two separate holidays. But it did used to be two paid holidays. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I, wow, uh, that's a real scam. Uh, you know, I think it was uh, they I think it also is done in conjunction with Martin Luther King Day being established. That one I couldn't I that was my memory of it, but I can't I couldn't. Find oh, it was, it was that was the, the trade. Wasn't that oh, yeah. Reagan who yeah. was objecting to that? We, yeah. we just had right. Martin Luther King the third on our podcast and he brought that up. <laughs> I, I stand corrected. <laughs> uh, but yeah, like uh, so Homer heads off to work. We see. The disgusting break room full of plain only plain cake donuts are left. It's it's cute that Homer was intentionally late and then is mad that because he is late, he has no donuts. Uh, but yes, Burns then gets on the intercom. It's also a very early in the series thing where like this scene written in season three would just be Burns would walk up to Homer and say, now all employees do this. But they're thinking more realistic of like, no, Burns yeah. have to go on the intercom to tell everybody. It's the same reason that uh, Wiggum is not on every, you know, call because yes. they're like, well, no, the police chief would be back at the headquarters and, you know, doing other things. But now, yeah, Burns would just walk up to Homer and say, you. <laughs> and, uh, and so the inspectors arrive. There's a momentary 
weakness and burns asking for smithers to hold him i thought that was cute i couldn't uh... <laughs> unfortunately smithers gets really pushed to the background with all of these new you know consultants he has there's very yeah. little smithers and burn stuff in this yeah uh, yeah that would have been more interesting tension there uh you know particularly in light of the uh uh some of the <clears throat> character development in terms yeah. of way yeah. smithers uh, and uh you know i mean some of the some of the more interesting episodes i always uh, i always liked were uh ones where uh smithers was alienated from burns in some way and resentful of it they they finally play up on that in the in the later politics one where smithers becomes deep throat to yeah uh, out of uh his uh yeah. choice of lifestyle as, as <laughs> yeah. smithers put it <laughs> but uh but yes the inspectors arrive everything's wrong with it their, their geiger counters go off instantly they're using an inanimate carbon rod as a paperweight. <laughs> this one is radioactive, though. Yes. Yeah. I, a funny thing I saw was uh, energy.gov did an entire article refuting this of like, this doesn't really happen in nuclear power plants. Really? Don't worry. Not this yes. Episode? Well, it mainly referenced, it was like seven things the Simpsons gets wrong about nuclear power plants, and <laughs> at least half of them were from this episode. There's not when a basement we- full of knee-high radioactive fluid? Yeah. <laughs> right, when was this? Uh, you know, I think it was like in the aughts. Uh, public, it, so, it, it was, Obama years or Bush It years? was very, it felt very Obama-era listicle writing to me. I, I didn't look yeah, at it. Yeah, yeah, must be. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> but, I, I am, I've always been curious uh, exactly how much just the Simpsons as a show has moved like a pain on nuclear power. Yeah. I wonder if it's made it less popular just because everybody thinks of the, of the, of all the jokes on Simpsons about it. This is irrelevant. Sorry. But the guy's name is Simon rich. He was hired by SNL. <laughs> oh, the okay. man. Oh, all right. And his, his dad is, Oh shoot. Now I just clicked off the thing, but rich, rich at the new, uh, Mark rich. Uh, the Swiss Frank Rich, financier. Frank Rich from the New York Times. Mm. So all my facts were half wrong, but that's what I was talking <laughs> about. <laughs> Uh, so the the whole sequence of Burns acting shocked is very funny too. I just love is like well, that shouldn't be. <laughs> I I, I put that into my own use in life. Yeah. Just if a if a landlord is like, hey, what's that? Like, oh, I'm just noticing this. It's always delightful when Burns is out of character and just acts <laughs> like this dandy. They give the animation correct. They're like, there's a hole in that uh, clipboard and it stays there. Hmm. Like, it does not go away. This is one you're going to queue up, but I always love when they uh, uh, drop in for surprise inspection on Homer. Oh, yes. Yeah, I do. <laughs> uh, Burns fail. Burns should have fired him right after that, you would think. He's he's uh, that uh, just resting his eyes. This was another one from the energy.gov thing. It's like, no, no, no. Oh, there's not just one person manning a monitor station. It's at least two. So... <laughs> Oh, okay. So for so that one guy can sleep when the other doesn't, like with yeah. pilots. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Uh, but yes, then came the very great scene where I, as an eight-year-old, learned what bribery was. In twenty years, I have never seen such a shoddy, deplorable. Oh, look! Some careless person has left thousands and thousands of dollars just lying here on my coffee table. Uh, Smithers, why don't we leave the room and hopefully when we return, the pile of money will be gone. (sighs) Look, Smithers, the money and a very stupid man are still here. Burns, if I didn't know better, I think you were trying to bribe me. (laughs) Is there some confusion about this? Take it, take it, take it, you poor schmo, Mr. Burns. I'll ignore the felony. Yes, I'll ignore the felony. Uh, Also, thousands and thousands. That's where he messed up. (laughs) He didn't offer enough money. Should have been a little higher. Yeah. yeah. Even well, you know, in 1990 dollars, it went a little farther. Five thousand bucks to ignore a potential nuclear meltdown. <laughs> <laughs> so my reading on the end of this episode is I always thought to myself, well, eventually after losing the election, Burns just found a corruptible inspector and bribed him and never did any of the fixes. <laughs> As, uh, yeah i guess this problem is never solved yeah i mean the the plant is worse the next time you see it so it's not like he fixed everything uh but i love that about that when burns finds out how much the improvements are going to be too like 56 million which uh, according to an internet inflation calculator that's 112 million today but even then it's like 
Burns, it's a pittance to Burns. He's a billionaire. Like, but he is so upset that he'd have to spend that money mm. on the company he owns. I don't know if he's a billionaire yet. You know, okay. They, they started have, him off yeah. pretty small on the on the rich man scale because rich men were not as rich in 1990. So I think he's still like a multimillionaire. Mm. Also, that is even if you are a billionaire, not to defend billionaires, that is quite a bit. <laughs> like ten percent of your net worth. And if, if I had one... to spend ten percent of my money to sub the bad faith podcast, I'd be pretty pissed off. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we won't defend after we get thing. inspected after we get inspected by the podcast uh, regulatory agency. <laughs> Fingers crossed. <laughs> we only need one billionaire patron to change our lives. Yes. <laughs> so we will defend billionaires in this case. Well, luckily we have nine times as many billionaires today as we did in 1990. So it's looking up for your potential patron. <laughs> There's more of a chance. I mean, yeah. A bigger Bree. pool to go from. Bree bringing the stats. <laughs> I also love that Smithers, like Burns decides not to hit Smithers only because he lacks the strength. He's like, <laughs> what that I had the strength to take it out on you. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, also like as a kid, I think it was influential on me to see how Burns, this obscenely rich man, 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 he thinks that he is now going to be broke if he has to spend $56 million. Singing his depression era tune. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, he's singing Brother Can You Spare a Dime, co-written by Yip Harburg, the blacklisted writer of the Over the Rainbow. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the the writer and the composer of the song were both socialists. Sorry, I didn't know that. So there's, there's, so there's a very smart kind of irony to doing that. So do you have a clip of that? Because I love this song. That to me is the highlight of this episode. Just the, the voice acting on the singing is... Uh, it's just like warbly. It's just like it hits both burns, which is a weird voice to do. And uh, but the fact that he's drunk. Once I built a railroad, made it run, made it race against time. Once I built a railroad, now it's done, brother. Can you spare a dime? Half a million boots. Went slogging through hell. I was a kid with a drum. Empty. Bah. No, it's uh, Burns is so pitiful when singing that song, though. He's just this sad like you. But I don't want to feel bad for such an awful old rich man. But no. he's so uh, I mean, also as an eight year old, I don't think I understood what drunk was. So I didn't know why Burns was being <laughs> so like mopey and or what a brandy snifter was. Well, there's just a great irony of this, you know, plutocratic asshole singing a socialist depression era song. <laughs> yeah, it's a problem that he caused. He'll still be rich no matter what, but mm. it's this moment where we have to feel pity for him. <laughs> and uh, I also like the uh, the reaction of Homer realizing like he grabs some overtime while sleeping. I really like that. Good, <laughs> good on Homer. The, the sad song ends with Homer walking down the hallway and uh, he calls home. There's a good little gag of him pressing the one button to call his uh to call home and it's like a quick speed dial i i think in the animation they realized like oh he didn't dial enough buttons all right we'll just make it speed dial just do that they also made the phone made a weird noise oh like the coming off the hook you mean yeah it was like a future phone (laughs) homer then it has a a, he walks down the hallway that's where we see a character not as popular as old blinky the it's the the glowing rat oh glowy yeah glowy the rat (laughs) Uh, not as much blinky has freaking like tons of i had a stuffed blinky i had gotten from universal studio yeah yeah i saw you could even buy your own blinky lure for fishing if you want to go fishing with the simpsons it didn't make blinky. a blinky fish restaurant at universal studios though no major problem <laughs> blinky simpsons trading car the yeah. glowing rat did not <laughs> i think i have a blinky pog right behind bob in the uh, just off camera there <laughs> uh but yes homer confronts sad old mr burns there's such a a really good shot of just homer like in darkness looking over mr burns and poor mr burns like the scared animal darting away from him though they're they're i will say their cars have never been this close in the parking lot ever again no no (laughs) and the idea of mr burns driving home is very funny yeah i'm a motorist (laughs) (laughs) he would be uh out of control if if you know he had to drive his own car but yes, Homer talks to Burns and uh, he realizes Burns doesn't have to just take this lying down. Working late, Simpson? Uh, uh, yes, sir. You and I are a dying breed, Simpson. I'm going to share something with you. Hop in. Ooh, cushy. Homer, they're trying to shut us down. 
They say we're contaminating the planet. Well, nobody's perfect. <laughs> Can't the government just get off our backs? You know, I was just telling the wife that if I was governor, I'd do things a lot differently. Don't get off your soapbox, Simpson. Do you realize how much it costs to run for office? More than any honest man can afford. I bet you could afford it, though. <sighs> Don't get me wrong. I mean, you're an honest man. I mean, it just meant that you could afford to run for governor if you felt like it. And of course, I'm just rambling because because you keep staring at me like that. But but it's true. I mean, if you were governor, you could decide what's safe and what isn't. Where are we going, sir? To create a new and better world. If it's on the way, could you drop me off at my house? It's not really clear where Burns is taking Homer or how he gets his car back. I know it's a very yeah. small point, but I was just like, where, where are they going? No, I was this? thinking about it. Like he's got to take a taxi to work tomorrow. Or something yeah. like that. Uh, so, uh, so it occurs to me, I never really made the Mr. Potter Burns connection. Uh, I, th I think because Burns's voice is more, this, it's more snake-like. It's more reptilian, isn't it? Mm. You know, there's this a kind of s a nasal sibilance to it that you don't really get with Mr. Potter, who's more of just like a big hollering guy. Yeah, Mr. I think uh, Harry Shearer is doing a bit of his Reagan uh, for oh, yeah. that voice. Oh, yeah. 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 Wait, did Harry Shearer play Reagan on SNL? He did, yeah. And uh, in, the, in really? the future, Burns would sound older. Here, he's got a lot more life because he's only 80 and not 104. Yeah, so yeah. He doesn't sound as much like Reagan as he later would, but it does. it's not a straight-up Reagan impression. It, he plays it a little bit more, so yeah. Yeah, that's a good... Okay, so it's Mr. Potter crossed with Ronald Reagan. That's great. That's great. I like this a lot more than later season Burns, to be honest with you. One, uh, th that's why like every animated sitcom after this has to have the town rich guy like every yeah. everyone because Burns is just such a compelling figure that you can launch any story off of really yeah um, you do uh, with I mean uh, Mr. Burns walk so Mr. Fishholder could run <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah I just also love like Burns connecting with Simpson like he again doesn't recognize him this is like the fourth time Burns has interacted with Homer I also they have MB on the thing but they're gonna have to set up that he's Charles Montgomery Burns later in the episode for the joke yeah of Charles Foster Kane it is the biggest cheat that they occasionally remember oh his, his name is actually Charles yeah because we had to have him say the line once <laughs> I also like when the the conversation ends with Homer it's a really good animation bit that like you are the camera is like stationary as the car backs into it and so like it goes hmm. through the windshield and like into burns's uh hood ornament like that which is like a neutron or a, i guess an atom i suppose i i'm not a scientist <laughs> um, just like homer pointing out like well you could afford it and accidentally making a witty uh reference to burns uh, without intending to i well yeah so obviously there are many examples of uh, since 1990 of yes. rich men running for office i mean it's funny because we covered this originally in 2015 and we were chuckling to ourselves about mm. this man with a uh, comical hair i forget yes. his name but yes. uh yes it's happened a few more times since then but i can't think of any like i i couldn't think of a i was trying to find a prominent one before for 1990 because like in, in 92 there would be ross perot which you if you yeah think like, oh it's a reference to ross perot but he's after this mm -hmm. there's a lot about this episode that reflects things that happened uh in the next four years for instance yes the idea of this uh plutocrat running for governor which feels very ross perot but this was pre-ross perot i mean i'm sure that's that's you know plutocrats have been running for governor for a long ass time but mm -hmm. uh, this i don't know if it's a specific reference to a specific candidate mary bailey being the opponent uh the year of the woman was 1992 uh, right. Called the year of the woman because something like four women were elected to the Senate. That's how yeah. <laughs> that's how dire things were at the time. And also, and and you flag this, which I I had not realized. Every act opens with and we talk about politics around a kitchen table, and you know that's not too crazy a thing. But I, that to me is reflective of uh I, I get echoes of the famous harry and louise ads that the health insurance companies ran in 1993-94 mm. uh to oppose clinton's health care bill and it was just uh you know this this is man and woman sitting across a kitchen table saying ah oh, damn it hillary clinton wants to take my doctor away can't believe that <laughs> and uh, uh you know those that propaganda uh widely credited with sinking hillary care hmm. Yeah, well, and also you think about like, you know, who's when I think of who's the most Burns like of uh, people who have run for 
offices i think of mike bloomberg like that's that's oh god yeah absolutely he's right down to the weird voice he could harry shearer could play mike bloomberg (laughs) on our last episode of bad faith podcast you we we ended up talking about bojack horseman briefly and you mentioned that you did not like the conceit of mr peanut butter running for governor and i'm curious how you feel about it in this context and what the difference is you're asking me the tough question Mm. i am getting put on the spot and talking (laughs) simpsons right now getting put in the hot seat uh okay well okay first off i like vaguely i'm just like look i i i I watch those episodes and i just remember not liking any of that crap because i thought it was not a sharp edge satire it wasn't particularly smart uh it doesn't mean it was like bad it was like fine i guess there were gags in it but it, it didn't really go to like an interesting you know smart commentary on politics which this episode i mean when i think about the simpsons political episodes i mean the gold standard is uh, sideshow Bob Roberts, you know, the ones that are specifically about electoral politics. This one, I think there's, you know, there's a little less bite to it. It's just a pretty straightforward story of a rich plutocrat trying to buy a political office. It's a satire of money in politics. And this was before the McCain fine gold campaign finance bill when, and this was also a, uh, coming at a period when money was getting really pumped into politics. Mm-hmm. The This was also at a time when campaigns were being professionalized in a way that they had not been in the past. Uh, I'd like to give you some idea of that, you know, uh, in the, you know, 1970s or so, Senate races could be rough for, I don't know, $5,000, something like the that. The amount of money that Mr. Burns might leave on a conference room table to bribe a... <laughs> yeah, yeah. And and this was, you know, by the late 80s, you know, there and the uh, realignment of the parties had a big impact on this. This is when it became necessary to hoover up all of this money from wealthy donors, from corporations, uh, political action committees. You know, that was uh, uh, they started to have a very big influence on things. And it's just been an arms race since then up to the last election cycle where just <laughs> Senate candidates were raising amounts of money. Money for losing races mm-hmm. that would have been unimaginable for a Bill Clinton to raise in 1996. I, I think, you know, if they can get to 200 million to defeat Mitch, I think they'll finally do it. <laughs> I think 100 million enough, 200, yeah. I think they can do it. Yeah. Seemingly Burns is not doing any fundraising. Yeah. It's just no. all his own income. <laughs> Very Bloomberg like again. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Oh, 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 no, I, I feel like I didn't answer the question. You but did maybe not. I can pretend <laughs> that I did. Okay, wait, wait. So what's the question? Why do I like this episode and not the uh, Mr. Peanut Butter episodes of BoJack Horseman? Mm-hmm. Uh, because, I mean, Peanut Butter was just, you know, just like goofy and facile and didn't really say anything <laughs> about politics. And it was also seemed like it would have been written by people with a distorted view of politics. And this one seems to be a more focused. I mean, it's, it's simplistic. I don't know. At the time, it might have been a little more. Uh, spicy or it seems to be a very specific criticism of money in politics and uh the you know the a wealthy oligarch purchasing a political office hmm. and the way that the mr peanut butter episode i'm sorry did that was there a satirical point to it yeah well first of all it wasn't an episode it was okay, like a, a b plot of an <laughs> arc but i think that you and i have a fundamentally different understanding of mr peanut butter as a character and you it's, it's a conversation right. for a bojack horseman podcast take my ja- should i take a, my, jacket, should I my jacket off right here yeah i think that <laughs> I, I think just, that you are, we, we you didn't are, want to get into it such a bojack that you kind of are dismissive of the idea that there could be depth to a character that presents superficially as optimistic and you take him at face value. And I think that's a mistake, but we can plumb that depth elsewhere. So <laughs> when this well, okay. podcast is no longer profitable, we will invite you back yeah. for the Bojack debate. But, uh, but hang on, as I understand it, your argument is I am so much like Bojack Horseman. Your orientation that I also, is to that darkness, yes. That I also dislike Mr. Peanut Butter in the way that Bojack, no. the character, dislikes Mr. No, Peanut Butter. No, that you like Bojack, like a lot of people, a lot of creative people. People conflate the idea of having, you know, dark, you know, being depressed as and, and complicated as being more interesting and complex when you can be happy and optimistic. I think the part, I think that Mr. B- Mr. Peanut Butter's character wasn't intended to be just a, a happy go lucky stand in, that he, that the, the show actually did work to give him depth and complexity as well. And if I recall correctly, his whole gubernatorial run was fallout from. 
um, the inadequacies of his relationship with Diane. Mm. And then there was a whole thing where his ex-wife was introduced as the character that was running his campaign. And there was a lot more there than like Mr. Peanut Butter is a happy puppy. <laughs> but again, I'm not trying to derail this whole Simpsons podcast. <laughs> there was more to it by which you mean uh, that he his relationship was on the rocks. Yeah. That was the that was the political complexity. Yes, and Bojack Horseman's complexity is that he's an alcoholic and needs to get over it. Okay, oh, <laughs> all right. Well. You no, know, I, I preferred the birthday dad arc of Mr. Peanut Butter. That was my favorite one. <laughs> I mean, the, it's great. Wh- yeah, which one? Like the birthday, birthday dad. dad. I don't remember that one. What was that art? <laughs> uh, it, what, what? It, it was. It was. It was. Wasn't one of many shows where he was in direct competition or basically stealing stuff. Well, yeah, it was. He got a birthday card that was for addressed to a birth happy birthday dad, and he pitched a show of like I'm the birthday dad. I save all the problems, and uh, that uh, he, that somehow was the most popular show on yeah, television. Yeah, he just keeps failing up. <laughs> oh, I don't, oh, man, I don't remember that. But, uh, you know, to be honest, I, I, you know, only watch BoJack Horseman when I'm blackout drunk and on ketamine. So, <laughs> oh, um, very, just very like BoJack whole... of you. And I'm boycotting all Will Arnett shows <laughs> <laughs> until he answers for his crimes. He broke uh, Amy Poehler's heart. Uh, okay. So back to the Simpsons here. <laughs> um, <laughs> We've lost half our audience. <laughs> uh, so, Act Two begins again at the kitchen table arguing about it. Marge is upset to find out that Homer is supporting Burns. They say they're a Mary Bailey family. I I do uh, like Homer has no political affiliation anyway. He doesn't say like, ah, that I never voted for Bailey before anything. He's just like, I'm doing what my boss tells me to do. <laughs> Mary Bailey isn't going to fire me if I don't vote for her. Hmm. Yeah, there's a little bit of, okay, I've got a compulsion to support Burns because my hmm. job, but he doesn't really make that argument so much as I'm a, I'm a dumb guy and I like Burns. Well, it's, I mean, it's very like MAGA kind of view. <laughs> <laughs> well, late later in the episode, Marge, uh, when she puts up a sign, it says independent voter. So they are very much trying to not label a party for either either side of this. Yeah, they, yeah. They didn't want to say Marge Simpson is a Democrat or whatever. It feels like Homer thinks Mr. Burns will know if he doesn't vote for him, though. Yes. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I think I, I never read the episode in that way because he's defending Mr. Burns in the the beginning of the first act before Mr. Burns even runs for office and saying, oh, it's a lot of bullshit. And this, this Mary <laughs> Bailey stuff. This, oh, we got to investigate nuclear power. I don't know. You could argue that. OK, well, that's because he knows that that's that's what side his bread is buttered on. But it might. I mean, it also kind of gives off this little vibe. And, you know, this is this is another kind of, um, you know, maybe this is a prescient thing. It also kind of feels like do you, you remember you ever read Our Dumb Century? Oh, yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. There was this one from around now, around this time, maybe 93, 94, that was the ignorant truck driver to address nation on Rush Limbaugh program. <laughs> and he kind of has the political views of like just some dumb jerk who calls into Rush Limbaugh. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, Homer does end up being a Rush Limbaugh fan in just a few years. Yeah. yeah true. Yeah. <laughs> or I, I should as, say Birch Barlow. I read I read Homer as supporting burns one just because he's a company man mm. you know he's, he's just a, i'm going to defend the power plant i'm going to defend my employer which there's something kind of human about that absolutely and then on the uh, secondly it's not so much i felt like the episode concentrated less on what homer actually does at the poll than the idea that he has to be perceived as publicly defending yeah. or, or supporting his boss or else he'll get fired so he has to play nice at, around the dinner table in the you know the final scene he has to put the yard sign in his front yard to like publicly convey that he's supportive of his boss and i think that that is a less ridiculous um belief to hell yeah and i think also uh, he thinks maybe that if mr burns wins he will prosper as well mm. it will trickle down to him in some way <laughs> oh absolutely absolutely uh, so i mean I, I mean i can see how it's one foot in both uh, also taxes they want to lower taxes that's mm. about the taxes all my love needs the taxes yeah I, I also you know it's a it's a mini arc in the episode but here at the second act opening with lisa at the dinner or breakfast table saying like oh i feel like a kennedy like she's so excited lisa has this like youthful excitement for it and you get to see that break yeah, in this episode too yeah and i I was actually surprised. I know I don't want to hop ahead, but I was uh, surprised that when they direct her to ask Burns a question at dinner, she doesn't push back. She asks the the simplistic, you know, give you know, free gimme question that they gave her to ask. Whereas I feel like later season Lisa absolutely would have foiled it or you know objected to participating at all. 
it's shades of the marriage counseling episode mm. where Homer pulls a similar <laughs> whack thing on the family and they all just walk out, maybe because they've learned from this experience not to go along with this kind of crap. Yeah, I, I think this is in this episode, it's writing Lisa more like, you know, a, a smarter than average, but a precocious eight year old yeah. instead of, you know, a more grown up person like in Sideshow Bob Roberts. She is campaigning for Quimby by saying like this time he's the lesser of two evils. Yeah. Like she's actually very informed, uh, much more informed politically. She's has very prescient of uh, how uh, some socialists treated the 2020 presidential election. <laughs> she is being written more like a kid in that she is just saying, you know, <laughs> an adult told me to do something, so I have to do it. She's not as, uh, you know, idealistic as she would be in the future, I think. And uh, so, yes, we then cut to an evil boardroom full of political hacks meaning to take down a very popular politician. You know, thankfully, that never happens in real life. Yeah. You never have to worry about that. But um, but I do enjoy this uh, this meeting of Burns's uh, team in this next clip. Now, here's the problem as I see it. While Governor Bailey is beloved by all, 98% of the voters rate you as despicable or worse. That's why we've assembled the finest campaign team money can buy. This is your speech writer, mm -hmm. your joke writer, mm -hmm. your spin doctor, uh -huh. your makeup yeah. man, and your personal trainer. Ooh. Their job to turn this Mr. Burns into this. Why are my teeth showing like that? Because you're smiling. <laughs> ah, excellent. Yeah, this is exactly the kind of trickery I'm paying you for. But, but how do we turn your average Joe six-pack against Mary Bailey? With this team of investigators, your muckraker, How do you your do? character assassin, nice to meet you. your mudslinger, ah. your garbologist. Hello. Their job is to turn Mary Bailey from this into this. The uh, visual aids help so much. Thank you. But first, <laughs> there's a burning issue that we need to address and neutralize immediately. Ugh, I hate that fish. I like that he gets a deck. He's, yes. he's presented with a with a slideshow, but you know it's pre PowerPoint. Uh, interesting note: garbologist is a real term. Really? Wow! Yes. It I means exactly what it sounds like. Man, I, yeah, I love how thankful Burns is at visual aids. He's like, <laughs> visual aids help so much. He's Thank being you. so friendly. Normally, he's trying to bash people's brains in with a baseball bat at these boardroom <laughs> meetings. Uh, you're right. Yeah, Burns is being more um, receptive to help from an area he doesn't understand. Not not normally how Burns is. It's a you know, it's a it's a good satire of just political consultants, and you know, pretty early on, you know, like I mm -hmm. said, at a period when you know this. The, the Madison Avenue, the, the the consultancy and the money going into politics uh, was accelerating. Obviously, that's that's been there throughout the 20th century, but you know, it really started to take off uh, since the 1970s. Yeah, this uh, this. I mean, I also think of to get back to Bloomberg. I did also think when they said 98 percent of voters rank you as despicable or worse. I feel like that's a discussion they had to have with the Bloomberg 2020 <laughs> offices. Honestly, if, uh, you know, if, if they made The Simpsons today, I think, really think Mr. Burns would be more modeled after Michael Bloomberg. Mm. It would be a, a cross not between Reagan and Mr. Potter, but Mr. Potter and Michael Bloomberg. I also appreciate just how many times they find a variation on the word Joe six pack. They just like they start from there and then they have to keep making up new ways to just uh, <laughs> insult the common man. When did that term come about? Mm, I, 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 I only know it from The Simpsons. Yeah, I only heard it from Mr. Burns. Maybe even they made up Joe Sixpack, but I would assume that that would be. Well, honestly, so much of this is pulled from the 70s. Yeah, like, Joe yeah. Sixpack dates back to at least the 1970s used in political context for the average male voter. Well, there Ooh, we go. Thank you. Uh, it sounds like a, it sounds like a, a William F. Buckleyism. Mm, uh, Johnny Lunchpail feels like it's earlier yeah. <laughs> or, or they created era. it. <laughs> Uh, or that's something that uh, that's on the Nixon tapes. <laughs> you have to. I mean, Burns canonically is friends with Nixon. He had visited him. And, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> I, I was like, well, Monty, they're going to eat me alive. <laughs> this this whole meeting like this definitely as a kid informed me of like, oh, this is how dirty politics can get like it. I'm sure it made me more cynical uh, on politics younger than I would have been. They are making their plans to take on Mr. Burns or uh, to take on Mary Bailey. I, I even love their just term of like neutralize. Like that's what they have to do. Like that you can't go forward unless you neutralize that fish. And, uh, and so again, another thing that feels so 
ahead of its time is the buying of time on television mm-hmm. to get like this is what Ross Perot did, but yeah, later other people must yeah. have done it, but before, but yeah, just basically buying an infomercial. I mean- I don't know. I mean, famously, Ross Perot did that in 1992, which we all remember because of the great SNL parody of it. Mm -hmm. Uh, But before that, I mean, maybe it happened on the local level. But uh, I mean, I only remember the Ross Perot part. So maybe just, you know, chalk this up to another uh, Simpsons predicted the future. This actually is based on a thing that Nixon did in 1952, in which I don't know if he bought time or was a lot of time on a station, but he had to get out in front of this scandal about him receiving illegal gifts when he was a candidate for vice president. And a line in this scene in this commercial uh, or this infomercial Burns is doing is a direct reference to that and his acceptance of a dog named Checkers as a bribe, a supposed bribe. 56, and he was he didn't buy that time. He was uh, allotted it. Oh wow! Okay, uh, man, I, uh, but he had. I, there's like a 30 minute uh, video of it on YouTube. He was allotted quite amount of time for that. Oh, well, he was the vice president at the time. So, uh, oh yeah, and we actually have a clip of uh, the original here. You know what it was? It was a little cocker spaniel dog in a crate that he sent all the way from Texas, black and white, spotted. And our little girl Trisha, the six year old, named it Chuck. You know, the kids like all kids love the dog and i just want to say this right now that regardless of what they say about it we're going to keep there you go so yes mm. that's uh when burns is saying why would you blame it all a little blinky here it's it's a reference <laughs> to the nixon thing but yes that's exactly where this comes from i had to have the checkers thing explained to me later but not because of this because homer says checkers is in doggy hell right <laughs> i i had to ask my mom for like well who's checkers what <laughs> <laughs> And again, glad that wasn't a syndication cut. I also, I, I think I recall like in 92 when Perot took over the airwaves, I probably did think like, oh, it's like Mr. Burns did. Hmm. It's buying time. We were in the era of Millie, I believe. Millie the dog. The oh, bush, yes. the bush hound. Yeah. That would have been very controversial if they had said, uh, you know, who's in doggy hell? Well, you know, Millie. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there. And well, the Simpsons are just like a few months away from uh, George W. Bush, H.W. referencing them. Uh, when this aired but okay so yes campaign commercial starts uh we get a reference to closing bars on election day which like that was over by 1990 right or maybe there's that, was that out. a real thing i ever? didn't know that was a thing it was a real thing it, it i don't know if it was really? a nationwide thing but it yeah. definitely was in like county by county it was i mean uh i mean it, i think it's obvious but it was so people would not get drunk and then vote they would have to make a sound decision that was the i guess the factor the i cannot yeah. imagine voting sober <laughs> that's the way to do it you make you it shouldn't. a party <laughs> you got to make a nice pattern on your little voting sheet uh i the closest i could find to like a timeline on it i found a philadelphia news story about like oh when did this stop oh that stopped in 1973 in philadelphia hmm. like as as a rule but, but that's just one city is the idea that people don't drink alone <laughs> Like, <laughs> the only way you could possibly get drunk is to go to a bar. I guess they figure, you know, back then in the in the fifties, it's like you'd only drink if you were in a bar. You wouldn't drink in your house <laughs> or at TGI Fridays. Like you can drink anywhere. <laughs> Maybe that's with the, why they gave with up the up. right attitude, you can drink anywhere. <laughs> I agree with that, Bree. You can drink in the voting booth. Yeah. You can be like Bojack Horseman with all his flats. <laughs> You're hidden. You know, it's a private area. Like anything is legal there. You can vape there. You can drink there. As long as you don't take a picture of your ballot. Yeah, no, don't, well, don't do that. They can't make you leave <laughs> until you finish can't. voting. <laughs> There's also a rather mean joke by Homer of saying that, like, that Marge didn't know how many eyes a fish had until it was in the news. Like, that's a real, what a dick yeah, move. He's yeah. repeatedly dismissive towards her throughout this, and it does come back to bite him in the ass. In a sexist way. I yeah. Mean, yeah. Uh, and uh, yeah, so Burns is forced to smile. Uh, he does a little bit on air of, of messing up and, and saying what he really felt. But then it begins the real ad. And I really do love that the it's a really good approximation of how these ads frame arguments, like uh, how political ad can frame an argument that he just goes like, oh, well, everybody hates this fish, don't they? Well, like, I, I think it's a really well done satire. Yeah. Uh, the act of playing most Darwin being authoritative on evolution 
Yes. Yeah. I, well, I will. Uh, here's something that has changed since uh, when we recorded this, like uh, in 2015 for me, I think I made the point of saying, Oh, a Republican like Burns wouldn't use Darwinism to prove something. Cause that's like how <laughs> science proves it. But I feel like now the like, now they're pro science when it comes to hatred of people. So I, I wonder if they would hmm. use, well, I mean, we've, We've heard all about like, well, science says about gender bullshit from from conservatives. I think it's, it's so. very selective. So if they wanted to use it to prove an argument, they probably would. Yeah, I, I got selection selective. I, I got to say, you know, all the people who were aghast for four years straight during the Trump administration and 2016, 2020 elections, like, how, how can he lie like this? How can he how can he say untrue things as a candidate running for public office? Uh, they just were not properly primed for this reality by watching this episode of The Simpsons. I, yeah. <laughs> I saw those ads and thought, oh, par for the course. <laughs> there's also something uh, to be said for the, the fact that there's like no commentary there's no perspective of pushing back you know the idea is that she lost because she's bland and good but honestly it sounds like she just is running a poor campaign mm. you know you can be good and interesting <laughs> you know she could have come back with ads that actually said real things about montgomery burns and him poisoning the entire town and wanting just tax cuts for himself and all the things that we know are probably the case but that maybe maybe the libertarian put the kibosh on that <laughs> yeah no that's okay i mean that's a good that's a good point i mean she's an yeah. income governor she should be you know able to run a competent you know well-funded campaign uh you know you didn't mention this but brianna gray has a little bit of experience mm -hmm. in this, uh, field maybe the maybe the audience should know that she was the national press secretary for the bernie sanders 2020 presidential campaign so uh, she might give you she might uh, so uh my steam colleague now here might... i am now how the mighty have fallen i'm giving campaign <laughs> advice to a 30 year old cartoon character <laughs> Uh, I, I think the problem is, though, it is just so much fun to write for Mr. Burns that when you're presented with a character like uh, Mary Bailey, you don't really care about her or putting her in your show. It's just yeah. like, no, I want to have Mr. Burns talk about old timey stuff and be a, a crazy villain. But yeah. yeah. Well, maybe who knows what kind of character Mary Berry would be. That kind of presumes that it's impossible to make her into a, a similarly interesting character. I, I think it was they didn't they wanted her to be just pure class and like the the a, a bland, perfect uh, politician. I think that that was just their choice there. Yeah. Yeah. Just to be the and it, it is kind of disappointing, but like just to be the foil of Burns. I don't know how well the episode would function if they had done a weird thing to Bailey. Like, I don't know. There's a lot of directions you could take it. Maybe she's uh maybe she is just like this this pie in the sky kind of hippie character mm -hmm. or maybe uh i don't know maybe she has some other weird quirk but i don't know i mean that, that is a pretty good distinction between like very early simpsons and you know golden era simpsons where okay later on they're willing to do an episode like sideshow bob roberts where okay everything is a joke and everyone has something crazy about them well I yeah I, I think, too, it is that in this moral universe of The Simpsons, I think they view more that evil can only defeat itself. Like the, the, you mm. can't succeed in defeating evil unless Burns like it hoists, uh, like slips on a banana peel himself or it's his own error. Well, but ultimately, Marge did do it right. Marge That's is the true. one who foiled the plot. And there's even a simple addition like Marge went to go and consult with uh, Mary Barry. What's her name? I keep wanting to call her Marion Barry. Mary <laughs> Bailey. <laughs> Mary <laughs> Bailey. <laughs> Oh, that's Sorry. who she's based on. Thank you. <laughs> she was smoking crack in a few scenes. So. <laughs> well, like Marge could have gone in and consulted with Mary Bailey's campaign, and they you know, there could have been an implication that they were hatching a plot together. You know, there 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 is a way that it could have not just come down to the whims of one housewife, well, but to I, the political strategy of an entire an entire administration. <laughs> she's she's been in office for many years, apparently. You know, they I, do this. Uh, they do this thing at you know now they do mock trials <laughs> yeah i famously what? won my firm's uh mock trial by the way really? for, for first and second year attorneys and the case was about nuclear power so oh, wow. this girl became an expert i know that i know I, I i know like supreme court justices participate in these I, I forget the exact context but they'll do like mock trials for like fictional characters right and like you know we're gonna litigate the the merchant of venus trial right and 
I feel like a, like a new genre, a new version of that should be political consultants like Brie doing mock elections mm. for for fictional characters. <laughs> and I feel like we should we should do this where you know, uh, like Brianna, you could run Mary Bailey's campaign, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I don't know, we'll get Frank Luntz to run uh, Mr. Burns's campaign, <laughs> and then and then just play it out. <laughs> I, 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 you know, I think in the world of this show, like the Shutton and the others in the media, like they really fell. They did not do their jobs very well here. They, I mean, once Burns is rising in the polls, they just repeat report on Burns, like, hey, he's doing pretty good. Like it's just horse race uh, reporting. Yeah, which, uh, that would they're, be like, irresponsible in real life, but fortunately, <laughs> doesn't happen. Don't get that. <laughs> it is kind of, you know, I mean, I, 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 like, I personally don't think this is a great episode, and I think there's a lot of missed opportunities, and there's not that much unity of action in it. And uh, you know, one of those missed opportunities is wait, Shun just doesn't show up anymore when he was an interesting character that we met at the very beginning. At the very end, he's one of the reporters on yeah. the phone about Burns, but that's it. Yeah, I, I think yeah. they're learning with this how to tell big stories. And yeah. This this is yeah. their biggest story to date after really just family focused things in the first season. So they have they have a lot to learn. Uh, and this is just them stumbling a bit in this in this first production episode. Uh, but yes, in our next clip here, Burns's message is reaching the people. The truth is, this fish is a miracle of nature with a taste that can't be beat. Mm-hmm. So to summarize, say what you want about me. I can take the slings and arrows, but stop slandering poor defenseless Blinky. Good night, and God bless. Old Fish of Oran would cast his boat on the deep earth. Wow, super fish! I wish the government would get off his back. That Burns is just what the state needs. Young blood. <laughs> I hope Burns and I can count on your support, honey. Homer, I'm a Bailey booster. Oh, yeah? Well, I'm a Burns booster. Ow! Oh! Congratulations, Mr. Burns. The latest poll show you're up six points. Ah, giving me a total of six. But we're on our way. I think in that last <laughs> scene, we do see Smithers and he's just fully decked out in Burns gear. It's very cute. I love that shot of, of him covered in all of the burn stuff. Yeah, that's great. Uh, but and that was Jeff Martin who wrote that uh, jingle for Mr. Burns. Oh, okay. That's uh, one of his first. I think it must be his first written thing for the show. I think so. Yeah. Writer of uh, songs from this era, like the monorail song. He wrote that. Any mm-hmm. little jingle yeah. here. City. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, seeing the winos get uh, really into this like propaganda mm-hmm. uh, that, you know, government should get off his back. That's I mean, that, you know, that absolutely cannot be a Schwarzwelder thing because he genuinely believes that. Yes, yeah, and I, it's very much so like a specific critique of Reaganism and that that neoliberal, uh, some, you know, we're going to drown the government in the bathtub stuff. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's I, interesting to me that the first three seconds of that ad during which Burns was, you know, castigating the working people had absolutely no effect on the perception of what followed. <laughs> That should yeah. have been the bigger gaff, not yeah. these fish spitting out. <laughs> right. He even in that pinata thing that happens later, like that, he just looks so foolish. He'd be like, no, he'd fall in the polls just from that. Like that to do jokes on Burns, they have to have him do gaffes that would make people lose elections most other times. Burns well, so Burns has the elephant there too, and they reference on the commentary that that was came back with the tusks were gray as well and they had to like argue over who's gonna have to pay to redo it like back now i think it'd be much easier for them to change colors in the computer programming but yeah i mean all for an elephant that shows up for i don't know eight seconds of this episode Mm -hmm. (laughs) uh, why did it come back gray uh just a a mess up on the uh, overseas animation side when they were getting an anime in Yugoslavia or whatever, <laughs> uh, it's, uh, South Korea, yeah. <laughs> but just also, I noticed that Abe is like covered in he's in his white outfit, uh, Grandpa Simpson. Like he's he's very season one and is all white get up. But but yeah, to oh yeah, to go back to like the government get off our backs thing. I do think it could be an example of as a joke on the show. They would have Homer or other characters say the insane stuff Schwarzwalder would say as as a bit. So as like a, when Homer complains, like, and hey, what do poor people do for you? Nothing. <laughs> Who'd ever give to charity? Like that was just them having him say what Schwarzwalder said. They're, around the they're just quoting him. Yes. Something he said in the writer's room. <laughs> Uh, but yes, uh, there's a long montage of uh, getting out the vote. March does some grassroots efforts on her candidate. Uh, we get a Dukakis tank photo reference, which 
is works for Burns. He moves up in the polls for it. And that will come back in uh, Homer's mom episode. Yeah, Mother he's, Simpson. Yep. Yeah. Hmm. He's he is invading wearing uh, in the same tank. And so he gets I wonder not- if this whole episode is just very specific satires of Dukakis <laughs> that we're just like not picking up on because we were all like three years old. Well, uh, uh, Sideshow Bob Roberts, a lot of it is about the Dukakis in Bush mm-hmm. election. Yeah, they do the Kitty Dukakis question joke in that one. And uh, which I would figure Simpsons in this, they're just like that. That's too extreme. We're not going to do that joke on the show. You also see Lisa and Bart have these shirts on. They can barely tell what their shirts say. It's it's a lot of words on one shirt. Uh, but yes, they they try to find some dirt on Mary Bailey. It's just that she got felt up by a guy and or tried to feel her up. And that was it. And I feel like uh, Burns would have used that to just go like, I'm not good enough that I, I feel like the d- garbologist would use it. Mm. Right. Also, the idea that that even if it were, quote unquote, worse, even if she <gasps> slept with a guy mm. is a negative reflection on the candidate. The candidate had a boyfriend in high school <laughs> is yeah. the dirt. It's not even a, a sex scandal or not even like sex is not even involved. Yeah. It's just the second base. <laughs> the teenager. Was, th- I mean, this was probably the sharpest, edgiest joke of the show of the episode. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, I was kind of shocked. They did. As a kid, I didn't understand the, what uh, felt her, uh, tried to feel her up line was, but that again, uh, this is also trying to make Mary is, you know, not toothless, but like is unobjectionable as possible. There's not one piece of dirt they could find. Like that, not one like nephew she got hired someplace or or unpaid taxes or anything. And it's again, it's a, it's a surprisingly woke joke for a Schwarzweller episode. Yeah, I I feel like more I credit that to Sam Simon, not to take a joke. Well, away of course, yeah. yeah. I mean, we can read. Yeah, I don't see it as well, a woke yeah. joke. I think that the the joke buys into the idea that if someone tries to feel you up, unless you think that they're just being like. They're very self-aware there and I'm not giving them enough credit, but it still feels like even if the joke is that if he tried to fail her up, if he so, so the fact that someone would try to find you to be sexually desirable and try to have some kind of sexual exchange with you, that that would reflect poorly on you in the first place. Well, I, I read it as uh, uh, more straightforward than that, that like the, like here's uh, the, the worst we could find was this thing about his relation uh, about a relationship that she had. And it's like, well, what happened? Well, he tried to feel her up uh, that this, these are the kinds of things that like female candidates have to deal with the sort of double standard. Yeah, I'm giving him way less credit than that. I don't in 1990. I think that I think the reality is that if a candidate, if a, if a female candidate had just slept with someone in high school and then that person talked about it, a consensual, normal thing, then that would for, that would be a, a, a strike against that female candidate. Mm. I think that's that's a real thing. And that the the joke here is that, oh, they didn't even sleep together. They just he he tried to feel her up. She yeah. being a Pollyanna or whatever, like this like church mouse, this this perfect person, <laughs> this pure, pure person didn't even let him. And that's why they couldn't use it. Not because, you know, the fact of her having any kind of sexual life wouldn't have been a slight against her. In this oh, kind of political I see context. what you're saying. The way I read it was uh saying it as if he groped her like well, that's that's how i read the uh but, uh, but that's the thing if, if he groped her why even if he successfully groped her why would that in, in a world where we didn't have sexism why would that reflect negatively on her well he that's the, I, her. well that's the idea that, that that they acknowledge that oh we can't use this because it doesn't make sense no i think that they didn't she, use it because she it wasn't was the victim it wasn't successful <laughs> not juicy they say not good enough it, it wasn't like, good enough. he didn't go far enough <laughs> Uh, after this, we get the most explicit Citizen Kane shot in the episode of just the uh, the rally, the Kane, the Kane for Governor rally, which was Kane at the height of his power. Is he even quoting the character too? Yeah. those fat cats in the state capitol. Yeah, or definitely the fat cats. He, paraphrasing, he, kind of. He doesn't talk about Boss Jim W. Gettys. Yeah. <laughs> uh, i just rewatched that over the holidays it's great one Let's day see. you're gonna have to do a an episode just about citizen Kane. Just about i citizen. know it's a slightly outside your wheelhouse but it's just impacted every show that you guys cover <laughs> i i'm i'm up for it i you know we both love it and it's still on hbo max Ooh. sign up today i'm gonna watch mank yeah. <laughs> i'm uh, signing up for hbo max now <laughs> uh though underrated in the reference here is not only the burns part but when it goes to bart and homer that is what happens after that speech in the movie kane's son and wife are watching it and the 
uh, the okay. son says, Mom, is dad governor yet? Not yet, son. And that's <laughs> that's what Homer Bart says to Homer. Thank you for pointing that out. I had no idea that part of it was part from the movie as well. It's uh, I, I had forgotten it too. I had also just recently watched it. So, but yeah, I just it sounds like we all need to subscribe to HBO Max for <laughs> nine a month and unlock the entire HBO Max library, including Citizen Kane on demand 24 7. You'll get every reference after mm-hmm. that. Uh, you can watch Wonder Woman 84 and uh, Citizen Kane, same day. <laughs> good, good. What a great just film. watch them back to back, and it'll just give you this totally weird outlook on life 10 hours later. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Yeah, uh, I Citizen Kane is is definitely shorter than Wonder Woman by like thirty minutes. I think. But if he had a magic stone, his life would have turned around. You should have had that wish stone, man. <laughs> could have, you could have got everything. Anyway, so uh, so yes, Burns is getting closer, but he needs to. And I'm just so surprised they just skip over any debate. They're like, what happens in uh, what the plan that is presented is on the night before the election. So. I guess there's never a debate or if there was a debate, they never talk about it. Maybe Mary Bailey didn't want to platform Mr. Burns. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, So no election night debate. None of that kind of clash of the Titans kind of climax. Yeah. This is actually a really good point. Now that I'm thinking about it, you had to go out of your way to write Mary out of the story. Like truly Herculean yeah. efforts to write Mary out of the story. I also think of these jokes about him like not being in touch with a common man. It kind of presages more like in 1992, the apocryphal tale of H.W. Bush doesn't know price scanners. Yeah, yeah. Which, you know, would not have happened uh, up to that point, though. Bush was, you know, he was uh, attacked as a patrician in 1988, though. I can't think of anything uh, specific about that. Clinton uh, and his team, they made it they made that way more of a uh, uh, an issue in 92. Uh, and, you know, th- you know, another thing uh, about, you know, Simpsons predicting reality, you know, I, when we meet Burns's war room, I do get a vibe from the famous documentary about the 92 election called The War Room. Yeah. Hmm. I also get, you know, a few shades of primary colors. The John Travolta, Romana Clay about hmm. uh, the 92, uh, Bill Clinton 92 election as well, which, you know, I'm sorry, those are the uh, uh, references that I know. <laughs> I don't know if there's something from, you know, if there was, if someone made a documentary about Michael Dukakis in 88 and it's just nobody watched it because <laughs> he freaking lost and it was just kind of the same you know idea of like a deep campaign documentary yeah i was actually thinking begala and carville must have watched this for some of these plans here but uh yeah like, you know, you know begala was clinton's garbologist <laughs> uh, uh that, that's a mouthful that that's a bojack horseman joke there begala. it is <laughs> Uh, yeah, so they come to the only conclusion they can in a sitcom that obviously the main <laughs> character, Homer Simpson, has to be the common man that they have dinner with. Uh, and I love that Burns frames it as like, well, I knew there'd be sacrifices. <laughs> he, he is the yeah. most common man and that he is eating garbage, scratching his butt and belching yeah. <laughs> in the footage that we see of him. What if they had just made it Lenny? Oh, no, it's just the way the episodes end, it's, episode ends, it's just Lenny. We, we don't even resolve. More. We don't resolve the Simpsons subplot. We'll see more of Lenny's house. Yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, I finally Googled garbology because when he said it sounds, it, it is what it sounds like. I definitely was thinking someone who dresses you in garb. Oh, that's a good, garbage. that's a, yeah, that's a good point. That's a good point. I thought it was it sounds, it sounds weird. I thought it was about uh, the study of Greta Garbo. <laughs> you know, Burns didn't spend much time with that personal trainer he was assigned either. Yeah. <laughs> he was just skipping days there. <laughs> I like the personal trainer. That's what I mean when I say I like the the I love the wonky animation on the background characters in this part because he's one of those rare early season Simpsons characters that does not have white eyes. It's just two dots. They're very close together. I think his hair is the same color as his skin as well. Yeah, he's he's breaking all the internal rules on character design. <laughs> the next scene opens kitchen table one more time and this is when homer just drops the bombshell that he has agreed to this which i you guys are right that the media really messed up here that like this story is that the wife is working clear if she's handing out stuff she's on some level working for the bailey campaign right you Mm -hmm. like bite into that there the uh, that's the that's the media's fault there (laughs) this is a real uh kellyanne and george conway type situation (laughs) <laughs> oh God! Huh. Well, that that would make that would make Lisa their their destroyed daughter. I that that, oh, that makes me God. sad. No, that's Maggie. I mean, when they age it up in the future, right? <laughs> Isn't Maggie the one that's kind of you know hot to trot, a little bit of a wild child? 
Well, she is a singer in the future. Oh, Maggie, right, right. So, yeah, yeah. You do that episode fifteen years on, and Maggie's a TikTok celebrity. Oh, God. <laughs> uh, but I, uh, but yeah, this uh, funny, uh, funny enough joke of the kids zipping off like in a very cartoony way, and then Homer implying that he's going to like yell at Marge, but he actually drops down and begs her for it <laughs> but either way it's just incredibly it, homer's just an insensitive guy this whole episode that's that's homer you know. did you say yell at marge but i feel like the implication was a little stronger than that perhaps <laughs> so yeah that's a little yeah. anachronistic again like kid you know the kids are like oh i don't want to have to see this <laughs> like <laughs> i'm gonna give you one right in the kisser kind of situation <laughs> well you know homer strangles bart but it uh, doesn't put a hand on marge well no. actually he does knock her out with uh um, chloroform chloroform in this season 12 episode so <laughs> that's a decade later we don't have to talk about that (laughs) oh goodness and in season nine he knocks her out with a nerve pinch he does do that too but doesn't strangle her that never (laughs) happens (laughs) you know brie you alluded to this earlier but you know what i what i do like about the this climax is marge who is you know again written by male writers uh you know her role is firmly domestic and firmly subsidiary to homer despite homer being a moron and using these dom- constraints of domesticity, oh, you can express yourself through your cooking. Uh, she cleverly manages to express her political views in that way. And, uh, you know, I, I, Henry, I think you brought this up earlier. Like, you can bear this episode to Homer's Odyssey, which mm-hmm. showed a very out of character Marge as a lush. And she was like, that was the episode where uh, it was Homer trying to keep the family together and trying to have a normal family existence. And Marge was like, yeah, who cares? Let's just get drunk and watch TV. (laughs) And this is where, I mean, maybe this might be the first episode where we get kind of like a fuller idea of Marge's character before that's, you know, fully explored with the, uh, you know, the flashbacks, uh, flashback episodes, uh, which I think the first one came in this season. Um, Yeah. I mean, yeah, we right. See- where it's like she was smart in, in high school before she met this guy. Yeah, we see Marge as someone with a lot of promise whose husband has clearly held her back for uh, over a decade. And that's, no. a, that's a great way. That, that's a great uh, direction that they took that character in a smart direction, I think. I think mm-hmm. there's like a very like a very clever satire there. It's something a little a little inconsistent for me that she didn't feel like she was able to just assertively say, no, Burns can't come here for dinner. Mm -hmm. She didn't feel like she was in a position to say, Lisa, don't ask him this pro forma question, ask him what you really think. She didn't feel like she was in a position to say outright across the dinner table, Mr. Burns, I support your opponent and I don't agree with your policies. But somehow it's okay for her to do this, like not very subversive, pretty blatant thing of feeding him the fish and i i struggle a little bit not to i'm sorry i know i'm not supposed to be picking apart this episode in this no, way that's why we're here but i do find myself thinking you know in these kind of domestic narratives as they're typically written there is some sense of like threat that keeps the woman from speaking out like i mean i have to listen to my husband because he's mm-hmm. the man of the mm-hmm. house or he'll take my own away and I don't have anywhere else to go or threat of physical violence or threat of verbal abuse there's something that says the woman's going to be subordinate she's going to sit there and take it yeah but then ultimately she does the thing which is just as it's not like she she did something that couldn't be attributed to her right it's not like she sneakily taught the dog to attack old men while nobody was looking mm-hmm. so that you know he got tackled out front but nobody could trace it back to Marge so she didn't get the blowback from her husband no she obviously cooked and served the fish yeah mm. well you know i i think a lot of uh james l brooks especially i uh, is as a person who shapes this and there's a few lines of marges that sound very much like james l brooks uh, he often does a lot of stories about um domestic women who are more passive aggressive in yeah. their and like uh, in their actions especially when they feel like they have no other option i think you know with a domineering man that's that's a lot of the stuff he's written i think yeah but, well, wait, i guess did... my point is that it's that was pretty aggressive the fish was yeah pretty aggressive mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah but it's also it's also clever i mean you know you didn't say you can't do that um uh, <laughs> did james l brooks produce nine to five Hmm. I don't think that's one of his. I don't think so. I, what what well, are you in referring terms to? Of endearment. Uh, oh, I never saw it. Broadcast news. <laughs> Broadcast news. Yeah, never saw it. <laughs> uh, well, you <laughs> know, uh, Virgil, you were <laughs> referencing. You were referencing earlier the way we was, and I forgot too in that one that Marge is like she's in debate. Like, she's, yeah, yeah, she's, she's very politically informed. So this is you could read it as this is 
her f- re-engaging with that while being, yeah. you know, this uh, homemaker she's expected to be. There is this idea that Marge is like she she's uh, subordinate to Homer, but as well, I mean, the you know, part of how I read it is uh, she is primarily concerned with the stability of the family, which puts the most strain on her to be as to be you know flexible and keep things together hmm. and this is her way of being you know creative in that task while also being able to uh, uh promote her political views in a way that's you know being denied to her throughout the episode uh well so in this next bit here i uh want i have a new clip of the uh them being prepped by the uh the political team here which i really love this bit we're hoping that one of the children might pop up with a question about the upcoming election. Little girl, do you think you can memorize this by dinner time tomorrow? Mr. Burns, your campaign seems to have the momentum of a runaway freight train. Why are you so popular? Very good. Hmm. Well, as long as I'm asking something, can I ask him to assuage my fears that he's contaminating the planet in a manner that may one day render it uninhabitable? Now, dear, the card question will be fine. Well, I think the non-card question is a valid Marge! Don't worry, mm. my daughter's very bright, and I'm sure she'll be able to memorize your question by dinner time tomorrow. And finally, Mr. Burns wants you to appear very affectionate to him, but we must remind you, he hates being touched. <laughs> Boy, Bree, when uh, Homer said Marge there, I was really thinking of your the implicit threat line this again. This is what yeah. I'm saying, guys. Like, I'm not trying to impose my you know 21st century values on The Simpsons. But the joke, these jokes land. The idea of subservient yeah. wife lands because mm-hmm. of the the low, the simmering threat of physical violence. That's it's part of the joke. It's all, it was part of the joke. And I love Lucy. It's part of the joke here. No, I have to agree because the Simpsons at this point in history, this is this is still thirty years ago. But at this point in history, they're written to be anachronistic. This family, mm-hmm. they're, they're supposed to be like out of the fifties or the sixties. So they have a lot of these older values. Are they? Why else would she listen to them? To <laughs> yeah, are they? Are wait, are they written to be anachronistic? I never got that impression. Yeah, well, they got the bunny ear TV and stuff like that. in in like the first season homer likes mambo he doesn't know who michael jackson is later about a year later like uh they, that would drop away as as they would need to write different jokes but they're supposed to be kind of like out of time i mean i view them uh always as you know not like not like ralph cramden types i mean though ralph cramden is uh, one of the inspirations for homer simpson who's a man who uh, engaged in threats of domestic violence very frequently <laughs> in one of the more popular tv shows in the 1950s but i always view them as uh just very much so just working class you know boomers enjoying the uh, uh fruits of the uh, uh post-war economic boom that are uh, over the course of the show like especially earlier seasons like increasingly they're losing access to that uh either because of uh, uh economic changes or you know because of this you know exploitative boss you know it's interesting is that in these seasons like there would be many episodes that would be driven by the fact that yes they can they can have three kids they can have a house on one income but they cannot at all suffer any kind of unexpected expense period that's it yeah they they're ruined by most uh what like one seven hundred dollar dog bill uh, yeah destroys yeah then that. that's that's a, the whole launch pad for an episode and that like that stopped happening around the time homer got an iphone <laughs> uh, well, uh, Bree, I was curious. What do you think of the framing of a t- of that mo- momentum of a runaway freight train question? That's not the best uh, uh, question. <laughs> yeah, it, it's it's also weird because they're kind of like if you're setting up a preco- like a, a question for a child, and the joke with Lisa is kind of always that she's a precocious child. Why is the joke? I mean, sorry. Why is the question written as though? they know that Lisa is a genius. Like, it doesn't sound like something that's coming out of a, a child's mouth. You know, you could just have her ask, wow, well, you're so successful, Mr. Burns. I mean, drawing the contrast between the complexity of her question and not just the content of the easy question, but the simplicity of it was kind of where I expected them to go. But they gave her also a very complex question, just one that helps Mr. Burns out. <laughs> yeah, I guess in the future in Sideshow Bob Roberts, they, Lisa would come up with her own canned soundbite where she says, Uncle Mayor says us kids are the greatest natural resource. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it was more like done in a childish voice. So she was a little more savvy than this uh, this campaign manager is. Right. <laughs> Uh, I I mean, they, I think so. the campaign manager was married to the phrase momentum of a runaway freight train. They're like, yeah, yeah. we got to get that. in there. Yeah, I'm not sure. I will confess that I was distracted. Um, I was jamming out to uh, Carly Simon in the album earlier today. <laughs> <laughs> and there is a lyric um, it's a, in a song about a romance that has it talks about wanting a runaway 
a, a freight train in a in a sexual situation. Uh-huh. <laughs> and I remember thinking to myself, oh, I, there's a lot of freight trains going on today in my life. <laughs> this just another thing that The Simpsons predicted was the hit 1990s song Runaway Train by Soul Asylum. Oh, all those, all those missing kids. <laughs> It's a real bummer. Um, oh, oh. The, uh, <laughs> I, I also, I like how dismissive Homer is of just like, my daughter's very smart. She can ask the question. She knows how to read a card. <laughs> uh, uh, and I also think most very w- rich people have handlers that go uh, ahead of them to say, don't touch this person. Don't, don't look them in the <laughs> eyes. Yeah, don't look them in the eye. They'll they get in their them. elevator. Uh, if Ellen is going to leave the parking lot, you get out of her way. Yeah, like, we are well, talking about Ellen. I, I, it goes for lots of people. I'm just. Uh, <laughs> I also I also uh, agree with the idea that you as a candidate should not say or intimate that your campaigns are a runaway train on route to victory, because that's a good way to depress turnout is saying, yeah, we basically already won. So mm. nobody worry about it. You're right. And poll wise, they're by razor's edge. They're one point. Also, they're trusting the polls too much like a one like. When they say at the dinner, when he says, like, congratulations, Mr. Governor, when they're just at 51 percent in one poll. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I also just do want to clarify the song is All I Want Is You and the lyric is All I Want Is You and Your Freight Train Whistling Over My Track. Uh. Oh, my. <laughs> that, that, that's where my mind recalled when that, <laughs> lyric, when, when that uh, quote came out. Uh, well. <laughs> Well, speaking of intimate situations, Homer tries to initiate one with Marge. Doesn't go too well. I, I think that really was pretty stupid of Homer that ahead of a very tense evening, he is uh, trying to <laughs> snuggle with Marge. Yeah, That's, uh, I mean, we see the dynamic here. I don't feel like snuggling. What's that got to do with it? That's That was an edgy <laughs> line, too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Again, I'm not trying to Gloria Stein in this whole episode. <laughs> <laughs> but that I mean there you could you could probably teach a whole class in feminism on some of the subtext. I, I gotta say, you know, I, I don't necessarily completely agree with Brie, but she's making some good points here. Uh and uh now that I think about it, Homer is far more loudish in this episode than he normally is. Yeah, that the well he becomes more and more of a kid as the series goes on. But yeah. Well then uh it comes to the family being prepared. There's a really good plan uh panning shot across everybody getting dolled up. Uh there's a line they had to change. So uh, before airing, so Homer's getting made up. And originally the line is, uh, you know, he's supposed to be having dinner with a common man, not Rex Harrison. But uh, Rex Harrison died four months before the episode aired. So by the time it aired, they're like, I have a change it to somebody else. So they changed it to Tyrone Power, who's been dead since 1958. So it was at least a dead man that nobody worried about. Well, there's Virgil, Virgil uh, the argument that it's supposed to be somewhat anachronistic. Mm. <laughs> uh, they, they bring up Tyrone Power. That's a well, that's a Burns line, right? Uh, well, uh, no, his, his campaign manager says Tyrone Power. Yeah. Oh. Okay. They also mentioned on the commentary a funny thing that uh, in '01 when they recorded it, they said, "Well, we try not to make jokes about l- people who might die by the time it airs." And they said they had just done a Strom Thurmond joke and they were really rolling the dice. <laughs> but uh, they're <laughs> died in uh, 2002, I think. Yeah, I, I looked it up. They did their joke in late 01 and he died. Um, he lived another 18 months after that. So they uh, it, it worked out for him. they've had a lot of screw ups uh, in that one. Like the uh, the visual joke where Homer steals the Oscar from the guy from the killing fields. That's one of their uh, yeah. most unfortunate uh, coincidences. Yeah. It aired once with that name on it, right? Mm-hmm. Before changing to Don Amici. Yeah, I'm, I'm just going to come out there and say, I just hope The Simpsons never references me. That's <laughs> very disappointing. You should have well, been mad that you weren't in their podcast episode. Yeah, they had other Wait, they did. Fine. They actually did a podcast episode. Ken, uh, it was about true crime podcasts. So, you know, oh, not my genre. Well, when they get to the political <laughs> podcast then I can be pissed off. <laughs> uh, I mean, we yes. have, I like my I've, I've interviewed Mike Grease and he's still on the show. So he's at least <laughs> familiar with my work. Hey, we have two. Yeah, we have an in. Yeah. Yeah. yeah <laughs> they should talk an itchy and scratchy talk an itchy and scratchy joke. I okay, there we go. Hey, that's my spec script. <laughs> but yeah, so it's the next day. They're set up for the election, the night before the election. 
They think the cornball stunt's going to put him over the top. Burns arrives with a, a dish of noodle kugel. noodle kugel. I always thought it was noodle kudel the way he pronounced it. I'd never had noodle kudel, the dish kugel growing up. Uh, but important important note that they didn't eat the noodle kugel because it's knocked out of his hand. So that's, right. that's why there is no backup food. Ah. He must eat the fish. And maybe there was a plan with the dog then to attack him to so get rid of the food. <laughs> they cut the scene where Marge is training the dog. <laughs> yeah, but also, it, in the animation, it looked like the pot was empty. And I thought that the gag was going to be, it's all for show. Mm. 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 Well, you know, Burns couldn't carry something, whole, a, a dish holding <laughs> food. Yeah. That's true. It's too much effort. <laughs> I love when he gets tackled both times that like they, you can really see in Burns how he is getting helped up and he doesn't want to pretend he hates that Homer is touching him, but he is going like, that's fine. <laughs> and then trying to pull away from him. <laughs> and yeah, so uh, after that attack, he's told that the statesman-like way you handled the pet incident puts you over the top. Congratulations, Mr. Governor. That's his mistake. Celebrating too early. You can't mm. do that. They've got like a, they've got like a Frank Luntz focus group just watching TV <laughs> this entire time, like <laughs> watching the dials. And, and phoning it in the results, apparently, because this is a pre-internet kind of a, a pre-smartphone kind of a situation we're talking about here. Yeah, you know, this is a pre is in 1990, were polls that quick then? Like, uh, I mean, I'm sure they were good, but are quick enough. I no. mean, I've been watching The West Wing for another podcast, and I feel like the poll uh, polls in the context of that show are still very much someone, a bunch of guys and women in the room on the phone calling for hours at a time putting it together i mean it's a plot point frequently that they aren't going to be able to get poll results within a certain amount of time and everybody's rushing to figure it out and that's shows filmed in like the, the early 2000s yeah uh I, <laughs> a lot of this is played for humor where like they find out within seconds and then everyone just leaves yeah that's true i guess that <laughs> is the joke yeah, yeah. Uh, bart gets to say grace in a very blasphemous way which i I do love Burns uh, recovering from that, like only an innocent child could get away with such blasphemy. And a lot of conservatives at the time underlined this line as a way to show the Simpsons are ruining America mm. and uh, Christianity <laughs> as a whole. I mean, for Falwell, if say a Jerry Falwell took that out of context, it does make the show look pretty bad. Yeah. As a non-religious <laughs> child, I thought Bart has a point. Yeah. Yeah. I, I definitely agreed with him as a kid. Like, yeah, we paid for all this. What do you do for me, God? Nothing. Yeah, Bart is uh, personally responsible for the creation of new atheism. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you're right. But Bart would definitely be in that. He'd be on 4chan. They haven't done a Bart Goes to 4chan episode mm -hmm. yet. But uh, uh, but yes, Home, uh, Burns is asked a question by Homer after he's aghast at how they all eat together, too. I love that. Just his, just hearing them wolf down food. And after complaining about uh, taxes and instructing Homer not to reveal that this was all planned beforehand, <laughs> uh, then he's given a tough but fair question by Lisa in this next clip. Lisa, do you have a question you would like to ask your Uncle Montgomery? Yes, sir. A very inane one. Mr. Burns, your campaign seems to have the momentum of a runaway freight train. Why are you so popular? Ooh, a tough question, but a fair one. Lisa, there's no single answer. Uh, some voters respond to my integrity. Others are more impressed with my incorruptibility. Still others by my determination to lower taxes, and the bureaucrats in the state capitol can put that in their pipes and smoke it. Oh, Mom, that felt awful. Oh, I'm sorry, dear. It will all be over soon. But, Mom, we've become the tools of evil. Lisa, you're learning many lessons tonight, and one of them is to always give your mother the benefit of the doubt. Get a decent break, or fair shake, or even a square deal. Mmm, smells delightful. <laughs> oh, right, <laughs> the eyed fish. Can I have your plate, Mr. Burns? <laughs> So there are multiple blinkies at this point, right? There's the one that Bart yeah. catches. There's the one in the commercial with Mr. Burns. Did Marge get another blinky? Yeah. Are we to believe there's a third <laughs> blinky on the scene here? Uh, I, I always assumed it was Bart's blinky he caught. But then if, again, if he did that, it had to be a month ago. Like, yeah. I, I wouldn't think the blinky kept too well. But maybe that's the point that it's a disgusting, <laughs> like old ass fish. fish. I guess, yeah, I suppose. But it's still moving too. Mm. I think the canonical Blinky uh, is dead. 
<laughs> and any other blinkies are false blinkies. You can read more. Uh, you can subscribe to my newsletter at SMB.com <laughs> and uh, hear this debate in full. That's because the Burns really set himself up in the in the Darwin clip where he was trying to rehabilitate the existence of Blinky because he didn't have to say it was edible. I mean, Blinky looks like a yeah. modified goldfish. Nobody's eating goldfish. <laughs> he could have just said Blinky is healthy and fine and superior to other goldfish and evolution's heading in the right direction without rounding out his comments with, and he tastes great too. <laughs> it's an odd comment, but I think he wanted to say, oh, also this fish is good for the economy because we can, you know, sell them to people <laughs> for food. He should have uh, stuck with selling them as pets. And yeah. Then, then he'd be governor of a nameless state. <laughs> when, oh. when I watched this as a kid very young, I never understood why Burns couldn't just eat Blinky. It, maybe, it's be, maybe it's because I internalized his message. <laughs> it's like, yeah, it's a normal fish. Who cares? What's I mean, one bite, Obama did take the sip of uh, Flint water. You got to oh, commit wait, to the no, bit. No, he didn't. He didn't take the sip. <laughs> well, he wet his lips. That's uh, not taking a sip. No, well, he, he could have he, he put he the could, fish. He could have put the fish in his yeah. mouth. Obama literally did the Mr. Burns thing. <laughs> and he was he just was like, yeah, I'll take his own. Oh, yeah, Flint water. It's all great. You know, I'll just put, put it on your lips we, and pretend to take it, a sip. It's right, Virgil. Are you saying it's not Bloomberg? It's uh, it's Obama. Uh, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it's like that was a pretty messed up thing that Obama did was after giving his whole damn speech about how great the water is now not taking a sip of the water. That's well, that's very what? Mr. Burns. Well, that's it's a just, statement on Obama's ability as a uh, like as a politician. He he didn't drink it, but looked like he did. And Burns did eat it and failed. Like that's that's really the test there for him. I can see why Lisa is so cynical from this point on in the show, just broken by this question <laughs> she has to ask. And uh, I mean, I also I do love how Burns rep- responds to the own, his own question. He asked is tough, but fair. Uh-huh. Uh, that's it. extra rubs it in. And he doesn't even care that she asks it. He just walks away. But but yes, we, one other bit of animation that's so weird in this. They do a thing they would never do on the show, which is that dropped jaw that goes down to like his stomach. That and that uh, is so cartoony. The very weird. Oh, yes. They put yeah. it in. It's uh, it doesn't doesn't really fit on this show, but no. uh, it wouldn't really happen again. But a fantastic when the animation goes like a tracking shot, like from Marge opening to to like up and down over Blinky, like that is such a great bit of animation and so is the spit i really yeah. like like how slowly burns chews it and once the, the the trajectory it flies across the room like i it's really well done for for season two of simpsons very good animation yes as it flies across the room they say that he was it was over before it hit the ground blown it for sure ruined before it hit the ground Give me the city deck. Here's your headline, Phil. Burns can't swallow own story. The latest Ooh. polls indicate Burns' popularity has plummeted to earth like so much half-chewed fish. You must Breathe. Have no your... left your sleeve. Smithers, boil some coffee. We're not late yet. Yes, we are. Come on, boys. The old guy's finished. Wait! Come back! You can't do this to me! I'm Charles Montgomery Burns! <laughs> <laughs> Okay, uh, so Bree, thing- if, you, if you were oh. working for Mary Bailey, uh, would you like that headline about Burns? Burns can't swallow own story. <laughs> you can't pay for coverage that good. Right? <laughs> right? That's smooth. Yeah, Bree, you're right. The, the media is, uh, the Springfield media is pretty fickle. They were all on Burns' ascent, and now uh, after the uh, the spitting of the fish incident, they're all, they've just turned completely on them. Which uh, he should have just bought the Springfield Chopper. Like that's what Burns should have done. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I mean, yeah, they're they're free Jeff Bezos paper. style. Yeah. If, if they are that fickle, it does seem to me that he should be able to turn this around. And if, if the Goombas all gave up on him that quickly, mm-hmm. I'm not like who's paying the Goomb. Like if if he if he if Burns wants to keep paying you to run his failed political campaign, you know the consultants yeah. in my experience stay around as long as the the money tap keeps flowing. <laughs> Yeah, those uh, Bloomberg consultants getting paid <laughs> ungodly amounts of money. They weren't like, ah, my guy's finished. Right. <laughs> you know, don't worry about my last invoice. I'm just leaving. <laughs> and uh, uh, that's when we get his fake first name, Charles Montgomery Burns. Yes. And, uh, you know, oh, the that's of the, the first, scene. first one. Yeah, I, I think that's the first time he announces it, right? Yes, yeah, because it's to set up the room trashing scene parody from Citizen Kane and where 
though in the movie when he says you you can't do this to me i'm charles foster kane he says uh doesn't he say that at the love nest when the uh when, yeah, yeah he's screaming at the reporter yeah. going down the stairs but yes it, it's a similar scene of an old man just trying to trash a room but what i love is that when lisa eventually stops burns burns is struggling with the piano as if he's going to tip the <laughs> piano over it's very improbable uh, and i love it i like that lisa is the homer can't stop him and in, in fact joins in and destroying things uh but lisa is able to pull it off and they decide they're gonna dis- destroy something tasteful and <laughs> i think comes what i wish was the final line of the episode because i think it's uh i they don't i know why in season two they wanted to end with the uh it, with marge and homer in bed but it's much funnier to say ironic isn't it smithers this anonymous clan of slack jawed troglodytes has cost me the election and yet if i were to have them killed i would be the one to go to jail <laughs> that's democracy for you You are graceful in defeat sir <laughs> <laughs> yeah the, the sweetness is fine but it's it's a much better uh ending you're right to go out on <laughs> i love hearing birds just say out loud i want to murder my political enemies and the only thing that's <laughs> Stops me is the law. Like that's that's such a great just evil thing for him to say at the end. What's well, a good contrast to Trump, who said, "Yeah, I, if I shot someone on Fifth Avenue, nobody would care." Yeah, that's totally. True. Yeah, <laughs> that's the difference in time. Like Burns seems to take it as a fact of like, well, obviously, it would be the end of my political career if I killed somebody. Like he he can he agrees <laughs> to that reality. <laughs> but this yeah, ending there's is a, there's a real specific. I mean, there's a palpable difference between politics in 2021 and politics in 1990. Mm-hmm. Where uh, you can imagine a plutocrat running for office saying, you know, "What if I did kill someone?" <laughs> Burns should have just spun that to be like my fish was poisoned by the Mary Bailey uh, yeah. woman in my in this house. Like arrest Mary yes. Bailey. Yeah, there you That's go. Perfect spin. <laughs> I'm better ready, spin re- guy than their team. You're ready to hire you anytime, Henry. <laughs> and the ending of this of this uh, episode <laughs> is very similar to a lot of the endings of these early Simpsons, in which it's finding success through failure, and that they might have lost, but Homer's ambitions are so low that he'll win no matter what. Yes, yeah. Burns, I hardly see what destroying our meager possessions is going to accomplish. Oh, she's right. Take me home, Smithers. We'll destroy something tasteful. Ironic, isn't it, Smithers? This anonymous clan of slack-drawed troglodytes has cost me the election. And yet, if I were to have them killed, I would be the one to go to jail. That's democracy for you. You are noble and poetic in defeat, sir. Simpson, I shall make it the focus of my remaining years that your dreams will go unfulfilled. Uh Uh-oh. You're busted, Dad. Oh, my dreams will go unfulfilled? Oh, no. I don't like the sound of that one bit. That means I have nothing to hope for. Marge, make it better, please. Can't you make it better, huh? Homer, when a man's biggest dreams include seconds on dessert, occasional snuggling, and sleeping till noon on weekends, no one man can destroy them. Hey, you did it! Mm -hmm. It's it's a it's a sweet little moment though, especially from from Bree's uh, reading on it. Uh, Marge being this quickly forgiving of Homer feels a bit cheap on yeah. that level, but <laughs> I guess it's her taking the high road. I, I suppose is how they're well, writing that it. That always works. Uh, it always works. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Back then they wanted to end it with the family, so I get that. But it's, it's I guess in the end, I I I like this episode as a political statement. But as it's their first big politics episode, yeah, the this, this show would be so much bigger politically uh, and and braver too in, mm-hmm. in stances. Yeah. And also, I mean, you know, aesthetically better, I think, you know, I think when I, I think you know, what makes the golden era the golden era is because it was, it was just like joke every five seconds and the jokes pretty much all a hit. And like that's the that's to, in my mind is the real contrast between this episode and Sideshow Bob Roberts, which to me is still the gold standard. Uh, and, you know, I, I know we're not talking about Sideshow Bob Roberts yet. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> Uh, you know, there's an interesting contrast between that one and then the later season ones when they were like satirizing things like Fox News and mm. it just it just did not hit as well because it did not have that same kind of surrealism. It became much more literal, for lack of a better word, liberal kind of humor. I think they were following Daily Show style too much. Yeah, like, like they they were they were following the pack on that stuff in the odds. What a young what a young people like <laughs> uh, this John Stewart. All right, let's get some of that. 
I mean, lately I've been seeing a lot of the season five episodes, uh, Democrats versus Republicans next by back to back, like Democrats, we hate life in ourselves. Republicans were just plain evil. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I've been seeing that referenced a lot lately for some reason. Mm, for I some couldn't reason. tell you why, yeah. but uh, that's a more, that's a more <laughs> just like piercing political statement than the sort of drawn out, you know, approaches that are found in this episode, I think. Well, yeah. Uh, Brie, any, any final thoughts yourself? As someone who is obviously not as regular a Sim- Simpson watcher as you fellows here, I actually was pleasantly surprised by how political this episode is because the more recent episodes that I've watched more recently feel less like political commentary to the extent that there's anything political in them at all and more of just a narrative depiction of like politics. This isn't, there doesn't even seem to be anything as, as sharp as the idea of corruption being presented as a norm, right? Like that, mm-hmm. I, I was, I was like thrilled to see that sort of a thing. And I'm struck by the extent to which in Washington, you know, the idea of a narrative that says your politicians are corrupt and you should get money out of politics. is perceived as being too highfalutin and difficult to mm. understand for the average man. So you got to, I don't know, promise them and earn an in- income tax credit or something <laughs> um, <laughs> when it's that sort of thing that resonates so deeply that, yes, you can find it in a 1990s episode of uh, uh, The Simpsons and everybody gets it. Even the kids get it. So I really liked it. I, this made me want awesome. to go back and watch more early Simpsons. That's Have you great. not seen all the early Simpsons, Brie? No, I didn't. No, I, I thought you as, caught you caught up when you got. I mean, I, I watched episodes, but I, I didn't encyclopedically oh, didn't go full, through and watch the full, Simpsons. Now, watch through. Well, yeah. you know, maybe we can cut a deal at some point. Yeah, uh, <laughs> where I'll I'll watch through Next Generation, and you'll watch through Golden Era seasons. No, uh, that's not a bargain. That there's no bargain there. You've already committed <laughs> to watching Star Trek. That's not how negotiations work. You sound oh, like a true. you sound like a Democrat coming in here. Whoa, let's let's have a fifteen dollar minimum wage when it really should be twenty two. <laughs> Sorry, Virgil. I, I'm not as I'm not as dumb as that political party. <laughs> You've already committed. But, no, but, but, now. but wait, I expect you to adhere to norms and <laughs> uh, you know do the right and fair thing. No, right? you're talking to a mansion. I know what my worth is. All right. As All a right. parliamentarian, well, I say that it should happen. He's uh, banging his gavel, yeah. folks. They have gavels. Guess what? Right? I ignore the parliamentarian all the time. Uh, well, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm, you can. I'm just trying. I mean, there's a lot to chew on here, and I actually think Bree's starting to convince me on some of our points, but I'm trying to think of other episodes we could do and come back on because, once again, I had a wonderful time. On oh, thank you. Uh, I'm sure Brianna Gray did, too. I did. This is a blast. Oh, thank uh, maybe you. Thank you so we much. Could do, I don't, have you gotten to The Simpsons Are Going to Africa? You're getting oh, close. we're coming up on that. You're getting close. Yeah. You, know, yeah. Bri, you know, Bree might have a... Uh, you know, she might have a personal view on that one. I personally, I, I, I have I, lived in Africa. I have nothing. All to of do it with. at the same I, time. I have nothing to do with it. If you want to do Brie as a solo, but I mean, I would be happy to hop on no matter what. Oh, well, sure. sure. I, I let's I I'm going to pencil that in right now. Yes. Sim- Simpson Safari. I think it's at the end of this season. We're do, uh, season 12. So well, <laughs> yeah. 12 brutal. It's not the best one, Brie. I'll just tell uh, yeah. you now. But um, another perspective uh, would help, though. Oh, also, it's an anti-union episode because Homer's mad at the uh, shopping bag union. Yeah, the bagger union, which yeah, is based union. on a real strike that happened yeah. in L.A. <laughs> oh, right, right. I forgot. It's uh, that was from the era of cold opens that had utterly nothing to do with the rest of the episode. <laughs> Thank you guys so much for doing the show. Yes. And, and where can everybody find you guys? You can find uh, us at our podcast, Patreon, Bad Faith at patreon.com slash Bad Faith Podcast. We do a free episode every Thursday and a premium episode every Monday. You can get the free episodes wherever you get your podcast and also unique to Bad Faith as compared to most other podcasts. We also have a beautiful visual component so if you prefer to watch episodes you can catch them at our youtube channel at youtube.com slash bad faith podcast uh once again i just want to emphasize patreon.com slash bad faith podcast that's the place to go if you want to subsidize subsidize this sort of thing yeah i'm a a proud patron yeah me too thank you you both thank you thank you i'm a patron of talking simpsons oh thank you i I, I, i've been a fan of your tanned and watch your near a watch thank you that's a very controversial segment you realize (laughs) oh but but thank you guys so much yes thanks to both of you so thank you so much to Virgil Texas and Brianna Joy Gray for being on the show. Please check out the Bad Faith podcast. We're big fans and we love having them on the show. 
As for us, if you want to support the show and get all these episodes one week ahead of time and ad free, please go to patreon.com slash talking Simpsons. Sign up for five bucks a month. You'll get just that, but also access to everything behind the $5 paywall. That includes all of our limited miniseries, the most recent of which was Talking Futurama Season 2, Part 2. And coming very soon is Talking of the Hill Season 2, Part 1. That's 11 new episodes of Talking of the Hill. That is our Talking Simpsons style podcast all about King of the Hill, only available to people behind the $5 paywall. And there is a $10 level. You get all the $5 stuff, of course, but also access to one mega long podcast once a month, only for patrons of that level or higher. Yes, Bob is talking about our What a Cartoon movie podcast. Me and Bob do weekly a second podcast called What a Cartoon, where we cover animated series in the same in-depth way we cover The Simpsons. And each month we do a often over four hour long podcast only for our premium patrons about an animated feature film. As diverse as this month, we're talking about DuckTales, the movie. The month before, the Ghibli classic, Whisper of the Heart, and a giant back catalog of films as varied as Tiny Toon Adventures, How I Spent My Vacation, Aladdin, a goofy movie, Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse, Akira, and tons and tons more. You get all of the $5 stuff that Bob just mentioned, but if you go to the $10 level, you also get the What a Cartoon Movie gigantic back catalog over 100 hours of podcasting for you, in addition to all the $5 stuff. So please sign up today at patreon.com slash talking simpsons as for me i've been one of your hosts bob Mackey. you can find me on twitter as bob servo and my other podcast is retronauts it's a classic gaming podcast about old video games find that wherever you find podcasts or go to patreon.com slash retronauts sign up there for two full-length bonus episodes every month henry what about you I'm Henry Gilbert, and follow me on Twitter at H-E-N-E-R-E-Y-G. Anytime new stuff happens in my life, I'm tweeting about it. Certainly have a lot of political opinions. And also on Twitter, you should follow the official Twitter account of this podcast, at Talk Simpsons Pod. If you follow at Talk Simpsons Pod... You-